All right, welcome everyone. A few people are still entering the room, connecting the audio, so I'll give it a sec here. All right, welcome. This is the 21st meeting of the House Bill 1477 Crisis Response Improvement Strategy Committee, and I am your facilitator, Jamie Strauss-Clark. So nice to see so many of you here today. Um, we do have kind of a special um, treat today and that we're going to be focusing our, um, a lot, our meeting on substance use disorder, uh, a topic that has come up frequently throughout these past few years together, but we have yet to have had a truly focused meeting on it. So um, I hope and expect this will be the first of many more in-depth conversations on this particular topic. Uh, we do have a panel discussion that's going to be starting at 12.05, and so I want to make sure that we do respect the time of our panelists and get to that as quickly um, or as close to on time as possible. So I'm going to dive us right into the agenda. I'm going to skip our my Zoom etiquette slides today and just remind everyone to please keep your mics on mute uh, during the meeting unless you're going to be speaking. And then Chris committee members, if it's available to you, particularly during the parts of the meeting where it's gonna be interactive discussion, if you could turn your video cameras on, you feel free to leave them off during presentations or the more one-way communications piece, but during discussion, if you could turn them on, uh, that would be wonderful. And then community members, if you could please leave your video cameras off, um, the exception being when we get to public comment at the end of the meeting. Um, and if you're signed up to make public comment, I'll call on you and invite you to turn your camera on at that point. I also want to make a note about public comment before we get started. Uh, typically, we invite community members to send an email to the project email box requesting to make a public comment. Unfortunately, um, that those emails this past time may not have made it to the person collecting them because she was out of the office. So if you emailed, Laura Van Tosh, I do have you on my list today for public comment. If anyone else emailed requesting to make a public comment at the end of the meeting today, please do send a chat to Chloe Chipman. She's uh, in your chat list and let her know you'd like to make a comment because we may not have you on the list. So again, if you'd like community members, if you'd like to make a public comment today, even if you've already emailed about it, if you could please um, send a chat to Chloe Chipman and she will make a list of people wanting to make public comment. Laura Van Tosh, you don't need to do that. I have you on the list already. All right, without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to our very own Michael Robertson, Chris committee member to offer some words of welcome, Michael. Um, let's check and see you, Michael. I did see you in the. Michael, are you with us? He is, Jamie. I see him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, what I can do if Lucy's here is I can skip ahead to Lucy. He's, he's oh, there. There you are. All right. Wonderful. Hi, Michael. You're up. You're up. You're on mute, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Whoops, Michael. You know it might work as if you want to try dialing in. All right. You know what we'll do while Michael is getting set up is, um, Chloe, if you don't mind putting up the agenda and meeting um, objectives. I'll go ahead and walk everyone through that and we'll give Michael a few I minutes. guess it works now. Oh, I, perfect. All right. I Thank you, Michael. Right. I go didn't double right. it, but I'm, I apologize for to everybody um, and the delay. Uh, I'm Michael Robertson. I'm 
certified care counselor and a person with a uh, lived experience of substance use disorder. Um, today, um, we want to welcome everybody for uh, this panel discussion primarily. Um, I've been on the CRIS committee since its inception. And so one of the things that I felt that was missing was the, um, as we've gone further into the process is the um, idea of, we were not including the prevalence of substance use disorder and how it directly affects the populations we purported inside of the language of this bill to be serving. Um, and I speak primarily of those that don't have access and those marginalized communities. Um, I think the pretense is to think marginalized communities and we immediately think BIPOC with limited access. But what we have gone to, even um, through this process and the amount of change in our communities is that um, our most vulnerable populations are on the street um, and that's where you see um, persons in living in crisis and almost invariably those persons are afflicted with substance use disorder and opioid use disorder in particular. Um, and I've said, used this phrase more than once with the Chris committee, for us to assume that we are addressing um, crisis response and its efficacy without addressing that population, I want to say primarily would be folly. Um, we, we've we kind of stood at the point to where we've, um, some persons, the persons that, the stories that we're hearing and the experiences that we've been sharing are valid. I'm not discounting any of that, but we're not hearing and dealing with a population that um, needs this service the most. If any of you can go down in the metro areas of Portland, Seattle, Spokane, um, and you're in the downtown metro portion and sector of those of those cities, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And those populations are not um, painted, I should say, into the bill by number. Um, not intentionally, but I, I just think um, I think we've we've vacated that portion of, of the communities that we intended to serve. If we're talking about true crisis response, then um, the idea of persons that we are supposed to be serving don't have a uh, opioid use disorder, substance use disorder overall is, is that's, it doesn't fit. And so um, today's panel, um, we've gathered some experts that are, um, going to give you a different lens in order to really understand how prevalent the persons that are suffering from crisis, mental health crisis, also um, may have this affliction. And so uh, I'm just glad everybody's here to really tune in. I just think that we can begin an on-ramp and a launch point of really beginning to serve and, and to um, really receive the language that's within the bill and that we aren't allowing unintentionally to paint a glossier picture for a better outcome. Is that fair? Um, I just I, I just hope that everybody receives something from this and that there's some great professionals today in the clinical specter that are really gonna deliver a really pointed message and give you some information, facts and some data and some experience as well. Um, that is all, I just wanna welcome everybody. Thank you, Jamie. Michael, thank you so much. That was a great setup for our conversation today. Um, I, I want to introduce next uh, Lucy Mendoza. You've met her before. Um, she's presented to this group before. She's with um, HCA. And, um, you know, historically, or especially in our early days of meeting, we used this time in our agenda to offer a land acknowledgement. But then what we really wanted to start doing was um, actually using this time to highlight uh, issues or achievements or innovations coming from um, the tribal side of our community, the tribes. And so Lucy is going to talk to you uh, in 
keeping with our theme of substance use disorder, she's going to talk to you today about a campaign that uh, the tribes are doing in partnership with HCA around um, opioid and fentanyl awareness. So I'm going to turn it over to Lucy and Chloe, if you could put up the slides that Lucy sent, that'd be great. Welcome, Lucy, and thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. And um, I just want to give a shout out to Michael. It's good to see you. And thanks for so much for sharing your powerful messages. And I've been seeing you around sharing and I just I'm, I'm always I always have a smile when I hear you. So, um, yeah, I'm going to share a little bit about the um, campaign work we've done with tribes in partnership. Um, and uh, I only have a few minutes. So next slide, please. Um, my name is Lucila Mendoza. I also go by Lucy. I work with our Healthcare Authorities Office of Tribal Affairs. Um, and, you know, our work is all about um, working in government to government partnership with tribes, um, you know, leading with tribal sovereignty, making sure um, that we're looking at um, inequities and in funding resources for tribal health programs um, and supporting tribal health programs as, you know, this is where folks can get access to culturally attuned care, cultural-based care for um, Native individuals, and also, um, you know, looking at health inequities for American Indian Alaska Natives. Uh, opioid response is such a high priority for um, our work with tribes. Um, you know, tribes um, are leading efforts in the state to make sure to address opioid um, and the opioid and fentanyl pandemic. And we just appreciate that they're working with us in partnership. So I'm gonna share a little bit about the campaigns. I post this slide because we actually have several tribal specific campaigns that we worked, we have worked on over the past few years. I'm not gonna get into all of them, but um, one of the things that we heard from tribes in the last year is, you know, there's so many different campaigns. Some are with DOH, some are with HCA. It's confusing. Can't we just have them all in one place? And so um, we're doing our best to try to just highlight everything together so that um, all the resources are together. Plus, um, in our experience working with tribal communities, they're not just looking at opioids, they're not just looking at suicide or mental health crisis. They're looking at everything holistically. And so again, just wanted to highlight that, but go ahead and go to the next slide. And Melissa, are you here today? Just want to see if Melissa, my colleagues here to help later on, but um, just wanted to give a brief history of the educational campaigns. We really started this work in partnership with tribes in 2017, creating. The I, I'm here, Lucy. Sorry to interrupt you. I am here. <laughs> It's I okay, thank you. you. But I'm All here. right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we started in 2017, um, and we launched the Tribal Opioid Solutions Campaign. That was, you know, a lot of work with Office of Indian Policy, Indian Policy Advisory Council, and you know, working through government to government processes to inform that campaign. Um, and that was really the first iteration. You know, over. Um, the next several years, we just continued to work to get those materials out. Um, in 2021 is when we launched, or we, the Healthcare Authority worked with Department of Health. They launched the Native and Strong Suicide Prevention Campaign. Um, and then in 2022, we began um, talking about fentanyl overdose and naloxone education as a priority during that time. And um, we got a lot of feedback from tribes that we need to have stronger messages. Um, we need to, our messages, they're not ours, but all, you know, everyone's, the messages for these campaigns really needed to focus on the urgency to address fentanyl overdose and the dangers. Um, and um, really what folks can do about that, which is, you know, heavy on making sure folks had access to naloxone and knew how to use that. And so um, the For Our Lives campaign was launched. Um, it's a campaign that's really full of storytelling and um, highlights and features tribal members, community members across the state in Washington. So they're real people. They're not stock photos, which is really a, a really key thing in a direction that we've gotten from tribal representatives. Um, we also had some campaign materials for Native and Strong Lifeline and Native Resources Hub that were launched. 
Um, and then in 2023, we had the first annual Tribal State Opioid Summit and the National Tribal Opioid Summit. So that's really informing our work for future work, making sure that we're um, addressing the concerns and the recommendations from those plans. Um, and again, we highlight everything because they're all very interconnected. And um, we also were able to work with the same contractor. So we followed the same processes even though campaigns were on DOH side of things, HCA side of things, we all worked together and followed very similar government to government processes. So next slide. Um, I'm not gonna go into this too deeply, but just wanted to share some information about the process that we had. This is not everything. There was a lot more steps that we went through, but again, um, the importance of working with um, tribal communities, tribal members, uh, urban Indian uh, community members that live in urban areas. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, informing of the campaigns. And I think we've done a really good job, but we can do better and we are working to do better. So next, next slide. Uh, this is more information about, you know, the process, working with native-owned production companies. I um, want to highlight that. Next slide. And then I think I can hand it over to Melissa now to talk a little bit more in depth about the For Our Lives campaign. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for um, hosting Lucy and I today. So I will be fast. Um, if you get anything out of this presentation at all, what I want you to know is that um, all of the materials that I talk about in these campaigns are available. So if they can help you, if they can help somebody that you know, if they can help your organization, please reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat and we can get you some of these materials. So the first uh, campaign I wanna talk to you about is called For Our Lives. This campaign started as uh, Tribal Opioid Solutions and has evolved. The goals are native-centered education, um, educating people about fentanyl and what it is, educating people on overdose and what that looks like, and then how to prevent an overdose with naloxone. Also putting in messaging about um, medication for opioid use disorder and treatment and recovery and talking about stigma a little bit. The audiences are um, Native people. We recognize that we do need um, a Native campaign focused on young adults, and I believe we're going to be working towards that, um, and also tribal communities. Oh, next slide, please. And so just some quick, quick stats about this campaign. Um, we had 26 million impressions. So that means people who got a pop-up ad about this campaign, people who at some point in time were faced with this campaign in some way. Uh, we had over 50,000 visits to the website. Um, as I said before, we have campaign materials available. And so far we've had 30 requests for toolkit materials. I think we can do a lot better than that. So please reach out and request toolkit materials. Um, we've had 99 placements in tribally owned print publications. Um, and what we have heard is that people feel that this campaign is authentic. They think that it's simple um, and thoughtful. So those are all really great things to hear. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, current activities uh, for the Four Lives campaign is each tribe is going to get $28,000. And that means that that is money that they get and they can take the materials from the campaign and show them how they want. They can almost create their own campaign using the campaign materials um, in the best way that they know how. And what we're actually doing currently is meeting with each tribe to find out what kind of technical assistance they want in the best way to push this campaign out. Um, we're going to expand the media buy to local networks and cable stations, um, daytime shows, March Madness, things like that. Um, we are also going to use funds to fund uh, urban Indian health programs, schools, tribal schools, and other organizations that work with uh, natives. Um, and we are gonna do a video shoot with tribal leaders, which I'm really looking forward to. And we are hosting a tribal opioid and fentanyl summit this year. And we will have a panel with tribal leaders during that summit. 
go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, uh, and then this is the Native Resource Hubs. Uh, Lucy, do you want to talk more about this? Yeah, I I don't think we have time to get into all these. Maybe that's mm -hmm. a part two for next time. Yeah. Um, but we have the Native Resources Hub. If you go to the next slide, these are all some campaign specific campaigns we worked on. The Native and Strong 988 line has specific materials that we worked on um, that are available. Next slide. And this is uh, the, the DOH's specific suicide mm -hmm. prevention campaign. Um, and the last two, they're actually, they, they're in the field, they're getting um, getting out into communities through like social media and things like that. So next slide. Again, that, and then back to you, Melissa, if you want to yeah. share. Just about and I'll, I'll be so fast because I know I think we've gone way over our time, but um, this campaign is, is new. It launched April of 2023. Um, it is called Friends for Life. The name Friends for Life came about because we had really good, really hard, and really robust conversations with our prevention team and our harm reduction team. And both of those teams, we all want the same things, but we don't always use the same words on how to get there. And what we came up with was everybody deserves to live. Everybody, regardless if you're using substances, if you're not, everybody deserves to live. And that's where we came with friends for life, be a friend for life, learn how to recognize an overdose, learn how to get naloxone, learn how to use naloxone. Um, and the audience for this is teens, young adults, and their parents and caregivers. And we have awesome materials for this campaign. So reach out if you want some. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This is our oldest campaign. Um, it's called Starts With One. It's been going since 2018, still evolving, still going strong. Um, the target audience of this campaign is young adults, their parents, and older adults. And we have all kinds of goals that you can see on the slide, but the biggest goal is don't share your medication, lock up your medication, send back your, your medications if you're not using them anymore. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and part of Starts With One is a partnership with the Washington State Hospital Association. And so we have created materials meant for clinicians and doctors and their patients um, all about ways that you, if you're having surgery, if you're living with chronic pain, how you can try to start with maybe icing and elevating and um, ibuprofen and Tylenol, not, not trying to minimize pain and what that actually means, um, but just trying to give other options and working with clinicians on how to talk to their, to their patients. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and that's it. Those are our campaigns. So I will put my, my name and my email in the chat and please reach out if you are interested in materials or if you want to learn more or have questions. Lucy, Melissa, thank you so much. Those campaign materials are beautiful. I am sure that uh, many of us will be able to make use of that. So thank you so much for um, the time you took to, to present. And it sounds like we've got more content that you can present to us at a future meeting. So we'll, we'll take you up on that. We could you part, yeah, we could probably do like a five part series if you really want. So. I, I think this is really valuable. So if you're game, I think, yeah, I think you're on. So I'll reach out to, to Lucy as a follow-up, but thank you again. This was wonderful yeah. and so timely given our subject matter today. Yep. Um, all right. And we're actually, we're doing okay on time. I just want to quickly run through our agenda for today and a couple of quick housekeeping items, and then we're going to move to our personal story. So um, you all know our focus today is on substance use disorder. So what's going to happen next is we're going to hear our personal story um, from Kate Vitella. And then we will move into systems updates and Q&A. Um, so that's our usual standing agenda item where we have time to talk about what you saw in the newsletter. We're also going to get a legislative wrap up from our legislators today. So that's exciting. At precisely 12.05, we're going to move into our presentation and panel discussion. There will be a brief presentation from two experts on our panel and then a panel discussion um, moderated by our very own Alicia Morales. Uh, we'll take aim for taking a break at one o'clock, and then when we come back together, we're going to do some group processing of what we learned in the presentation and panel discussion. 
Uh, we'll move to action items and next steps at 145 and then enter our public comment period at 148. And again, community members, if you would like to make a public comment today, please send a chat to Chloe Chipman and she will take you down to make a public comment. Really quick before we move on to the next agenda item, I wanna very briefly introduce um, our newest uh, Chris committee member, Laura Pippin. She's here uh, representing designated crisis responders. She's from Washington Association of Designated Crisis Responders. Um, I, I think I might be catching Laura a little bit off guard here. So I, I um, Laura, you're, you don't, don't feel obligated to say anything, but I just wanted to um, make sure that we welcomed you here and are so thrilled to have you as part of the, the group. Thank you for the welcome. I hope everybody's doing well and I appreciate being here. All right. So I'm gonna um, quickly turn it over to Betsy, who's just going to walk briefly through um, our decision process. There's been a couple of um, smaller changes and then we'll um, move on to uh, our personal story today. Chloe, if Thanks, you Amy. Perfect. Hi everyone, Betsy Jones with Health Management Associates. I'm facilitating um, leading the facilitation of our um, 1477 um, process here um, on behalf of the Behavioral Health Institute at Harborview. Um, so most of you are familiar, well familiar with this decision process map. I just want to flag that we have taken a bit of a detour and I think a, a, um, a really good one um, in our conversation today about substance use disorder, really focusing on the intersection between SUD and the crisis response system. So we're really looking forward to this conversation. Um, in April, we're gonna pick up our discussion of system performance and oversight again, and continue through June um, with those conversations. Um, we will likely be sprinkling in other things as we go along, but um, we're really focusing, as you all know, on, on um, system oversight and plans for the future. Um, in July, we'll be talking about system infrastructure, um, looking at cross-system collaboration uh, more deeply, um, having an update on the technology platform, and talking again about staffing and workforce. Next slide. Uh, in August, we're going to have a lived experience focus. Um, we'll be talking about um, the lived ex experience stories project. Um, that we have planned and um, making recommendations for system improvements related to those stories and the, um, the issues that arise um, from that process. Looking in September at, um, uh, it, which is also an in-person meeting, at draft policy recommendations, which will form the foundation of our final report. Um, October, just a, a, a month off for everybody as we draft the report. And then we go through November and December um, reviewing input and then finalizing the report. And then in, on January 1st, 2025, um, we submit the final report and recommendations. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Betsy. Okay, I think that concludes this portion of the agenda item. So um, I'm going to now turn it over to Pasha Mukherjee, who's going to introduce our personal story today. And um, there's some slides to accompany the story today. Thank you, Jamie. My name is Vipasha. She, they pronouns representing lived experience on the Chris. I'm going to keep it shorter because our speaker is who you want to hear from. I am privileged to introduce this person, Kate, multifaceted human, RN for over 20 years, person with lived experience, a coach, mentor, fashion blogger, fashion model, wife, stepmom, doggy mom to rescue Marley, who lived a good life and died recently. And I'm sure there's a lot more to her as there is to all of us as human beings. On her website, uh, katevitella.com, Kate says, and so I'm going to read her own words, my mission is to evoke hope and courage and a sense of community through sharing my lived experiences. I've journeyed from rock bottom to redemption and survived to share my story with the world fearlessly. I don't believe in scaring or shaming people into recovery. I inspire people to have hope in healing. I feel hope is more contagious. 
After our chat with her in preparation for today, I got a glimpse of how authentic and fearless she really is in owning all the aspects of her life. She integrates her passion for behavioral health, medicine, with her passion for fashion. And I'm so, so looking forward to all of us hearing from you today. Kate, go for it. And I'm talking while I'm muted. Thank you so much for the introduction. That was fantastic. Yes, I am Kate Vitella. I have been um, an RN for, yeah, a couple of decades uh, in the Pacific Northwest area. And I like to say that I, I sort of became an adult um, as, I, as I became a registered nurse. I was so young when I first joined the profession that I was sort of learning to be an adult as I was learning to, to be an RN. And um, I knew that it was going to be a stressful profession. I, I didn't know that 12-hour shifts often turn to 14. I didn't know that patients or clients can get dangerous and assaultive. I didn't know that I was going to be under massively high stress. I didn't know that I would develop PTSD and insomnia and a myriad of other complications. But I chose the profession because I had a really strong inner knowing that I was supposed to be out in the world helping people. But personally, at home, I wasn't taking great care of myself. And over the years, I became a daily drinker. Um, I was self-soothing with alcohol in excessive amounts. And then I picked up the use of THC when that became legalized in Washington State. And so much time went on when I was self-medicating with alcohol, not sleeping, struggling with massive anxiety and depression, and I was too proud and too ashamed all in one to ask for any help. And as time went on, my drinking and drug use got so severe that it was hard to hide. And in 2017, I was working as a home health nurse locally in Olympia, and I was going to see a patient and I got in an automobile accident and I needed to do um, an incident report for my company, which required a drug screen. And I panicked. And in my cloudy thinking, I thought it would be a good idea to bring in fake urine to throw the drug test because I did not want to get caught for THC because I knew that nurses aren't allowed to smoke marijuana because it's not federally legal. And this is also an alcoholic brain making this decision. So when I went in to provide a sample for my drug screen and I had this fake urine with me, I dropped it right in front of the lady collecting the specimen and it rolled on the ground. And I had to admit everything. And I was crying and hysterical, but it didn't matter. I was fired on the spot. I was escorted to the curb and uh, they have to, asked me to leave the premises immediately. So during that time in my life, I my car was totaled from the automobile accident. I had been fired from my job. The only thing I knew was excessive drinking and excessive THC use. I didn't have any healthy coping skills and I didn't have any hope. And I became suicidal. And it was, it was a combination of sort of slow, passive, um, lacking, lacking a will to live, not caring if I slowly drank myself to death, but then around uh, mid-2017, I got a letter from the State Board of Nursing saying that I would be reported for tampering with a drug screen and that my, my nursing license was in jeopardy. And this was well over a decade, almost two decades into my career. This was my identity. And so I 
made an attempt on my life because I thought there was no other way out. I was admitted to a psychiatric facility. I was detained for danger to self. And I spent 10 days in a facility north of Seattle. When I got out, I entered the monitoring program for nurses. And I'm going to fast forward my story there because that was a five-year commitment of random drug screens and meetings and work towards sobriety and a lot of uh, soul searching. But one thing that it taught me was there is no us in them when it comes to substance use disorder and mental health issues, that I was equally as vulnerable as my patients for wanting to take my own life, for wanting to give up, for, for wanting to succumb to drugs and alcohol and to literally feeling there was no way out. So as I re-entered the workforce as a nurse, I decided to go to work in mental health. I am now a psychiatric nurse, whereas previously my nursing experience was all in medical or acute care. And recently I attended the nursing conference for the state of Washington, where they went over all the initiatives for all the Washington healthcare providers. And primarily the focus for nurses was substance use disorders, the monitoring program, and what happens to nurses after they are reported to the state. And for the first time in five years, I heard another person say they tried to take their own life when their license was in jeopardy because their substance use was so bad. And my story felt validated. Suddenly I realized the gravity of what I had gone through in that I was so ashamed that I didn't think I could seek any help that I would have rather taken my own life than admit that, 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 that this is where my drinking had led me. And I had so much fear around this. And when I drove home from that meeting, I made an internal commitment that I would keep talking about this until there was some resolution. Because for the duration of my sobriety, I have been out loud sober. I have been a person who shares my sober story in hopes of inspiring other people to seek an alcohol-free life. Because I didn't know that there was this beautiful life on the other side of sobriety. I just didn't know that. And if I didn't know it as a nurse, I figured other people didn't know it. But I wasn't really speaking out much about my suicide attempt or my mental health struggles because that felt like another level of taboo. But once I attended this nursing conference and realized there was this direct correlation from when nurses were notified that they were in trouble by the state board to them taking their own lives, I realized this affects all of us. We are all in this together. And I just want to kind of normalize who I am as a person. Although I've been a nurse my whole life, I'm a human being first. And I'm a human being just being human, looking for a way to self-soothe, to ease the pain, to sleep at night, to deal with the trauma of caring for others. And I can forgive myself now for that part of me that didn't know and didn't have any hope and didn't have any answers and was just doing the best I can. With my, with my love for sharing my story and being out loud about sobriety, I came across uh, an online magazine called The Sober Curator. And I reached out to the editor and I ex explained a little bit of my story. And 
she said, well, what do you know about the arts world? What could you contribute to this? And I said, well, I've been a nurse my whole life, but let me tell you, the last thing I want to talk about is nursing. I want to talk about something that lights me up because through this whole journey, I realized I didn't really know much about myself besides being a nurse and taking care of others, but I knew I really, really loved fashion. And I, I felt like what we wear says so much about who we are, and it really could be a tie-in to how we care for our mental health. So I proposed to write a fashion blog for this online magazine, and I've been writing that for about three years now. That's what I do in my free time. That's who I am outside of all this other stuff. And recently, the Sober Curator partnered with a nonprofit organization out of New York called Break Free, and they put on a fashion show uh, dedicated to mental health and addiction. And I have had the privilege to be on the board as well as model for this show during New York Fashion Week for the last three years. So I'm gonna have you, oh great, there's the slide. So this is yours truly on the runway. Three years sober, four years sober, five years sober, six years sober. Modeling in a show completely dedicated to mental health and addiction. And I don't show these images as a frivolous way to say, look at me, look at me. I show these images as a way to say, this is a woman who tried to take her own life several times and truly felt like there was no hope, that there was no hope beyond drinking and drugs and losing my career, losing my marriage, losing my friends and family, my community reputation. I was pretty sure I had lost it all. And I get to be here today to tell this story and I get to write this fashion blog. And I, I feel so much passion for making sure the narrative continues about hope. And especially for those of us in the caregiving sector, you know, we so commonly think that, that we're the caregivers, we're the healthcare providers, and then and, and there's these other people right? There's this us and them. And that's so not true. Because depression, anxiety, substance use, the the want, the desire to want to end your life, I mean, that can happen to anybody. And so I really appreciate you giving me the space to share my story. And I just want to be mindful of time. Because I, I know that you guys have a big agenda. But I really hope that some of this is a takeaway for um, the really low dark places you can be with, with substance use and um, the way that you can emerge resiliently with the hope of community support, with the help of, of partnering with resources, with programs, with people not giving up on you. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today, Kate. Your story is very poignant for the discussion that we're going to have here today and helps us continue to break down that wall between those who provide care and those who need care. That's something we've talked about a lot as the lived experience representatives on the CRIS, but there really isn't a line there. We're all the same people and sometimes we all need help. Thank you. Hey, wow, thank you. You're um you're an incredible speaker too. And and just I, I'm getting all kinds of messages from people in the chat saying how moved they are by your story and, and I think particular how relatable it is and your message about this being something that can affect anyone. So um thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your beautiful pictures. Um I put your website in the chat. I just took a peek. And it's gorgeous. So everyone, please, please go take a look. Um, and, and, you know, just thank you for making time to be with us today and share your story. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Oh, everyone, I also have the email from our first presenter, Melissa. Um, if you'd like to, I'll put it in the chat in just a moment, if you'd like to reach out to her to access the materials that she shared on opioid and fentanyl awareness campaigns. I am going, it looks like we're, we're doing okay on time. Um, I'm gonna move to our updates. Um, Rep Orwell, I uh, wanna turn over to you to do the legislative update. We'll have to stop the updates part of the agenda right at 12.05 to start our panel discussion. But if we don't get finished, I'll circle back to that after our break. So I am going to um, turn it over uh, first to Representative Orwell to start the legislative wrap up. Um, and then we'll do a little bit of um, check in with you if you have any Q&A about from the newsletter. And then um, I think that's it for our updates today. So um, I'm going to turn over to you, Representative Orwell. Thank you. And, and just, Kate, I just feel still so moved by um, your story. It takes a lot of courage to share your story. And it was, it was, it was very moving. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, we got a lot of good things done this session, uh, a lot of good behavioral health bills. Um, we have a bill signing. I think a lot of folks were invited to um, Friday at the University of Washington. I think half the behavioral health bills are Senator Dingress. So I'm assuming she's here to speak to all of her bills. But I do want to mention a few. Um, and some, you know, I just think there's a lot of focus Obviously, we want 988 and all the services uh, associate that to be successful, but there's also a lot of focus on the workforce and supporting people doing this work and expanding it. Uh, one of the bills I'll mention, House Bill 2088, uh, that was a bill I sponsored uh, on behalf of the healthcare authority, really trying to add some liability protections. Because as we're doing the rapid clinical response and we're doing all these teams, we want to make sure they have the tools and protections and, of course, the training. But we, again, we're kind of re-modifying our system to look differently. So we're trying to kind of uh, make sure that those protections and support are in place. Um, there also was a lot of work, and I want to do a shout out to Representative Bateman, the Department of Health had did a really good process, thank you, to identify what some of the barriers were in the workforce and what we could do about expanding the workforce. So Representative Bateman did kind of a larger DOH bill. And, you know, an example would be, you know, having uh, PhD psychologists um, being able to uh, kind of have almost like practicums or trainings. And so they have like associate positions. And again, uh, a lot of the theme of the bill uh, is really about training and training sites for professional. Uh, the one component they had as a recommendation I did, which was the social worker compact bill, which kind of helped streamline social workers who wanna work in our state. And so I think we became state number three or four to uh, pass the compact. Very proud about that. Uh, also, I wanna do a shout out to Representative Callen, who really is our champion around behavioral health and uh, the uh, K-12 system. And she did a bill to expand the behavioral health uh, kind of task force, which does a lot of great work and recommendations that we do every year, uh, targeting funding and support in our schools. Um, I want to do a shout out to Representative uh, Lakanoff because she really um, took the lead around the Native and Strong line, and her, her work got incorporated into uh, Senator Dingra's bill, but it was really to codify the Native and Strong line and to expand text and chat, and we did a $2 million investment to help that happen, so we're really excited about that. Um, Representative um, Davis, who I adore, I'm assuming she's going to be on the panel because she's like our substance use expert. If she's here, we just we just love her so much. And she has just done so many great things. And Michael, I want to say thank you. I thought you did a great introduction of us focusing on substance use. And before this meeting, I was listening to Dr. Kenneth Minkoff talk about co-occurring capable programs and expansion. But one of the things I want to mention that Representative uh, Davis introduced was really around THC concentrations. And we're really concerned about these high-level concentrations and how they impact uh, 
people's behavioral health, especially our youth. And so she had a very robust pill, but I think at the end of the day, she was able to move it forward to really have a work group and more study in this area and see how we take actions. So, um, so that's, that's the updates I have. Again, Senator Dingra was the behavioral health champion. And so hopefully she's here to give that back. Unfortunately, Senator Dingra is not here today, but fortunately, Senator Warnick is here. And so I'm going to give um, the mic over to Senator Warnick, and then Betsy can speak to one of Senator Dingra's bills after that. Welcome, Senator Warnick. Thank you. And I'm sorry I was very late. I had a, a crisis of my own. And so I, I'm, but um, Representative uh, Sen did a great job. Uh, and uh, uh, explaining some of the bills that have come through. I don't have anything actually to add to that uh, that I can think of at this point. So glad to be here and sorry I was late in, in getting on the uh, meeting, but very important work that we're doing here. Very important. Well, I'm so glad you could join us today, Senator Warnick, and um, thank you for echoing what Representative Orwell shared. Uh, Betsy just has one more update to share with us related to legislation on behalf of Senator Dingra. And then we can talk about the newsletter. Thank you. Unmute myself. That always helps. Um, this is related to Senate Bill 6308, and it speaks directly to our Chris work. Um, and it has to do with the Chris extension. So there, there are lots of moving parts still, um, but just wanted to give you a very high level overview about the committee extension. Um, so the 2024 legislation um, extended the time frame for the CRIS work through December 31st of 2026. Um, the committee's final report and recommendations remain due as of January 1, 2025. So the decision process map that I presented earlier is um, correct. Um, and we will continue to facilitate the work that we're doing through the delivery of that final report on January 1st. And then facilitation will be shifted to healthcare authority after the submission of the final report. Um, as I mentioned, we're still working out lots of details, um, so more to come. And um, we will update you further as we continue to coordinate the transition. Um, and just a note from Nicola that we are going to include bill summaries in our April newsletter. So um, all the relevant pieces of information will be included um, for your, um, for you to digest. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, one last update for everyone. When we met in February, we shared a little bit about the lived experience stories project. Just wanted to let you know, we don't have any details yet for you to update you on. We'll have an update in April. There's still some, um, pieces of that that need to be worked out before we can follow up with you. So our intent is to share more in April. Yes. Representative Orwell. Thanks, Jamie. I remembered one very important bill that I didn't mention. It was the first bill that the governor signed yesterday, which is nothing about us without us, which they've been working on, on several years. It's a beautiful bill. They had a great turnout and it was awesome. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So glad to hear it. Hopefully they didn't get completely poured on, but I guess that's kind of an occupational hazard here in Washington state. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. Uh, you've got the newsletter. Are there any, um, we have, of course, um, HCA and Department of Health folks here today um, to answer your questions. Any questions or comments that arose for you after reviewing the Chris newsletter for this month? Darcy. Good morning. Um, I do have a question regarding, um, I saw uh, in the newsletter the um, DOH rulemaking regarding their um, uh, tracking that they want to do uh, for um, hospitals and behavioral health agencies. And one component of that tracking is to have improved patient placement for behavioral health facilities. That seems um, pretty redundant with the bed track bed registry that we're looking at for Chris. And so I'm wondering what the opportunities are to uh, have those two work in collaboration and not have the behavioral health facilities having to report to two different bed registries. 
I know we have Lonnie Peterson with Department of Health on today. Lonnie, is that something you can answer? Or is that something you might want to circle back on? Yeah, I think I need to circle back on it. Um, thanks for the question, though, Darcy. It came through to us also from um, Nicola and Betsy as well. And so I wasn't able to get an answer to that by the time the newsletter was due. Um, but we're still looking into that question. Um, and I, I have reached out to some of our um, healthcare authority folks that are working on the tech side of the work just to make sure I understand exactly what's being done. But um, we're still working on a follow-up um, answer Great. for you. Great, thank you. All right, and we'll put that question and follow up in, in our list of action items and we can circle back, Lonnie, when you're ready. Thank you again for doing the legwork on that. Kristen, I saw you pop your hand up there. Did you have a question or a comment? I found the answer in the newsletter, so I figured it out. <laughs> oh, that's great, okay. Uh, any other questions or comments from Chris members? We actually do have a few more minutes if you have them, so please feel free to jump in and ask. Kashi. I was going to try to type furiously, but I'll stick my hand up instead. Kashi Aurora, I work at Seattle Children's and represent Children Youth Behavioral Health Work Group on this work on this committee. Um, I saw a note about an actuarial analysis and report for crisis services funding, um, and it seems like there's an early draft of that report. Is it possible to share that with members or potential crisis services providers to get a sense of um, what these rates look like and how we could be expanding the crisis continuum? Great question, Kashi. Betsy, do you have a, a thought on that? that? I'm, I'm wondering if Matt uh, is Matt Gower there, and Matt can at least give some um, context. There he is. Yep. Matt. Hi, apologize for the weirdness. My laptop died, so I'm doing this by phone today. Um, but the initial report hasn't been published by OFM yet. Um, once it is, we will be happy to share the report, but it won't have any of uh, the rate information or any suggestions. It's really just kind of an update on the work we have done so far. The final report will come out in December. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for jumping in there. Any other questions from the Chris committee for our estate agency folks who are here today? Okay, and just a reminder to Chris committee members, if you have any updates from your work that you would like to share, you are also welcome to contribute that to the monthly newsletter. Just um, send it to Nicola. She's usually assembling this newsletter starting about two weeks before our meeting so that it can get out to you one week before. So um, please do feel free to, to send any updates you have to Nicola and we'll include those in this newsletter. It's a great, great way to share some of your great work that you're doing. Lonnie. Yeah, thanks. I was trying to figure out how to raise my hands. <laughs> Um, Nicola reminded me um, uh, about some of the um, working sessions and listening sessions that are coming up um, for folks who are interested in contributing to the um, state suicide prevention plan that's being updated. Um, I know that I think the plan is to have the updated the updated plan by July. I'm not sure when the plan will actually be published. But I know the update date, um, they're, they're shooting for July. And then um, there's a flyer here being shared on the screen with some more information um, about those listening sessions. And um, if anyone has questions, I can um, I can take them back and get uh, try to get some answers for folks too, if there's any questions. I'm so glad you brought that up, Lonnie. I actually had that as a note that I needed to mention that the update. So thanks for catching that. Okay, any final questions from the Chris committee? All right. Oh, and Anna asked if, can we get the link to those listening sessions? Yes, I will follow up after the meeting and send that uh, flyer by email and I'll look for an electronic link as well. Okay. Great. All right, so that'll be going out. We'll put that as an action item from this. And then I have a note from Kashi that I'm gonna put out to the group. Bear with me just a second. Hmm. Okay, there's something from Kashi. All right, 
Great. Well, we are right at 12. Um, so let's get set up for our um, presentation and panel discussion. I'm going to just um, briefly walk through you through what's going to be happening um, today in our discussion. We're first going to hear um, a presentation from Dr. Mandy Owens from University of Washington. And by the way, you should have received uh, the panelist bios yesterday, yesterday, I think um, Nicholas sent it out to you so that you can see everyone who's going to be participating today. Um, but Dr. Mandy Owens from University of Washington um, is going to be presenting on giving us all kind of some level setting around how substance use disorder intersects with mental health crisis and some of those drivers of substance use disorder how it appears in behavioral health that may look different from other behavioral health crises, and then um, increasing our understanding of who is affected by substance use disorder. So, you know, she's gonna give us that kind of overview. And then um, Dr. Uh, Fotinos from um, Healthcare Authority, our state Medicaid director, is going to present on current state efforts to address substance use disorder. Uh, and then we're going to move into a panel discussion that Alicia Morales is going to be moderating. And Dr. Owens is going to be participating on that as well as Dr. Fotinos, but also um, Representative Lauren Davis uh, from the 32nd Legislative District, Michael Robertson, and Dr. Lauren Whiteside, who's a clinician and uh, emergency department physician. And Alicia has some questions that uh, we've prepared to ask the panel. And then if there's any time left, we can maybe take some questions from the Chris via chat. So that's how we're going to proceed today. Um, Chloe, if you could pop up Dr. Owen's slides, I will cue her up. All right, Dr. Owens, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Great, thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Mandy Owens. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an assistant professor with the Addictions Drug and Alcohol Institute and a clinical psychologist at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And so these will be the perspectives that I am bringing today. Next slide. The three main take home messages that I wanna emphasize is that mental health and substance use disorders are often seen together among people in crisis. And it's really a disservice if we keep mental health separate from substance use disorder. And that that's harmful both to the individuals who live it as well as our community. And that's really on us to provide training and support for staff working in these spaces so that they can be effective in responding to folks with comorbid mental health and substance use disorders, and I would argue to save lives. Next slide, please. So when we look locally at Medicaid data, so among people receiving Medicaid in King County, this is um, folks who've been identified as having any mental health disorder, any substance use disorder, and those with both mental health and substance use disorders receiving services here. So as you can see in the purple and green boxes that folks who have a substance use disorder, about 14% of those in King County, almost always have a comorbid mental health disorder at 12%. It's a smaller proportion among folks who have a mental health disorder, which is about 42% of those on Medicaid, and about a third have a comorbid SUD. But again, of note, these are just folks who've received services in King County and not necessarily representative of folks who are experiencing behavioral health crisis. Next slide. Those data are much harder to find. And so when we look nationally at other types of data, this is a sample of 23,000 people who were arrested and it looked at those who had mental health only, substance use only, or both. And you can see on this green bar that the biggest proportion of people who were repeatedly arrested had both mental health and SUD with smaller proportions having only one or the other. Again, obviously people who are arrested are not necessarily always the same as those who are experiencing behavioral health crisis, but they often elicit the same type of 911 response. Next slide, please. Uh, for a project that I'm working on, I've gone to seven counties in Washington state and I've talked to law enforcement and people who use drugs to talk about solutions to crisis response to drug use. So this comes from one group of first responders, law enforcement who are working in Eastern Washington. And as you can see in that red circle, some of the challenges that they are feeling is this strong connection between drugs 
and mental health. And they express a lot of frustration about the disconnect in services that we provide separating out mental health and drug problems. They talked about referring people to mental health services and those, those people would just get kicked out because they were seen as having a drug problem, not a mental health problem. They also expressed a lot of confusion and frustration around the ITA process, which I'll talk about here in a second. Next slide, please. When we think about the unique needs of people with comorbid mental health and substance use disorder and the implications, the first thing that immediately came to my mind was the issue of stigma. The research is extremely clear that people who experience substance use have additional stigma related to that use that hurts their mental and physical health outcomes and retention and services. In this green bubble, when I talk to folks who, uh, prescribers like a primary care physician about why they don't provide buprenorphine, I literally heard these words. We don't want those people in our waiting rooms. Thanks for <laughs> spelling out ITA. Uh, so you can really see why people who have substance use disorders are not likely to seek out services and why they might not wanna come back to folks like <clears throat> that primary care physician um, who don't treat them well. Uh, so same in my field, I work in healthcare. There's a lot of stigma against substance use that's also seen in first responders. And so an implication is certainly needing more training to reduce SUD stigma among those working in this system so that they can provide better care, referrals, and so that people are more likely to keep using services like 988 and other things. Next slide, please. Another one that I'll try to describe is this very complex relationship between mental health symptoms and substance use. So when I see somebody in a behavioral health crisis, I can't always know right off the bat, is this, is this because of a, a substance use or an organic psychiatric need? And that's because substance use can both mask and mimic mental health symptoms, right? So we can think about somebody who is maybe appearing as acutely psychotic, and it's hard to know is that long-term schizophrenia or acute intoxication on methamphetamine or use of methamphetamine that eventually led to long-term psychosis. We also know that when we look beyond that acute state, it's really hard to disentangle clinically substance use and mental health treatment. And that's because substance use can both exacerbate mental health symptoms, but also can medicate. And so right now from the research, the standard of care is that when you're able to, it's best to treat both at the same time rather than separately. And so again, that trickles down to, it's important for us working in these spaces, working with these folks to have a knowledge of array of services for both mental health and substance use so that we can make appropriate referrals. Also recognizing that I've seen plenty of patients who have both, but only wanna work on their mental health or they only wanna work on their substance use. Next slide, please. Also inherent in the use of illicit drugs is often more criminal histories, which add a whole lots of employment and housing barriers and another layer of stigma, even just beyond substance use. We also know that ITA laws differ for mental health only versus substance use disorder, SUD. So, uh, and that this can create a lot of like frustration among how to respond to folks in the field. So for example, somebody in the field could present as meeting criteria uh, for grave danger due to a mental health disorder, be appropriately brought to the hospital, Maybe then they had the opportunity to sober up or their intoxication went down and they no longer meet criteria for grave disability because they are now able to take care of themselves. And so this leads to a really frustration repeat cycle for both the emergency room staff as well as the first responders who see people kind of go in and out of this cycle and get dropped through the cracks. And so it's important to help support first responders in this potential like burnout and frustration of cycle and to help uh, provide them with the, the nuance to be able to look through the lens of both mental health and substance use disorder to make proper referrals. Next slide, please. I'm sure extremely well known to this group is the increasing rates of drug overdose related to opioid and methamphetamine use. And so any opportunity to provide naloxone and overdose education is going to be important for folks who have both um, mental health and substance use disorders. Next slide. 
in this sample of about 1,100 people who died of a fatal overdose in King County between 2019 and 2021. On the y-axis, the left side, you can see the array of services that people had engaged in in the year prior to their death. And so what this really says to me is there's all of these opportunities that we could have intervened on this and provided naloxone, gotten them started on buprenorphine or provided overdose education, any kind of thing that we could have done to prevent that death. At the very bottom, you can see a behavioral health crisis event. Although a small proportion of this sample at 58 out of 1100, I think we would all agree that those 58 lives certainly would have been worth trying to save and intervene. Next slide, please. The last thing that was asked was any ideas about performance measures. And so this would be true for thinking about performance measures for mental health and SUD, the detection of needs across the spectrum, referral to any services, including harm reduction services and engagement in mental health and SUD services. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Owens. That was a great uh great overview it gave us a lot of good discussion points so really appreciate that and look forward to hearing from you in the panel discussion shortly i'd now like to just uh, introduce dr Teresa fotinos uh, state medicaid director who's come here to present on some of the state efforts to uh, address substance use disorder um, and there are no slides accompanying this presentation dr fotinos Great, thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, thank you, Dr. Owens, for that overview. Um, I myself am a family medicine and addiction medicine physician, and have spent about 30 years um, taking care of folks who have both uh, mental health and substance use disorder use or challenges. Um, so uh, this is a, a topic that is is close to my heart. I think that you know certainly people are if people define crisis in their own way and how you and I would define a crisis might not be how everyone else is. Certainly when we think about the use of substances and people who may report that they see someone in crisis or reach out to the crisis line, certainly could be someone who's using stimulants or methamphetamines and acting like they have a, a, an acute psychosis. Um, it's not so common, but PCP, angel dust back in the day used to have people behave similarly, sort of out of control. Um, can't forget alcohol. People can behave, you know, somewhat um, concerningly or differently when when they have alcohol use. So I think we people who aren't used to seeing folks who are intoxicated may perceive a crisis. And so I do think that having an understanding and an ability to respond to people calling in, I think the obvious crisis. And I I don't know, but maybe if someone's afraid of calling 911 because of the police response, they might call the crisis line if someone's experiencing an opioid overdose and they're not breathing or they're breathing less or they're not able to wake up. So I do think it's important to know how sort of significant um, health manifestations may show up in people using substances. And as Dr. Owen said, a lot of people experience, experience mental health and substance use disorder um, conditions at the same time. Um, they may be using one to medicate the other. And in a way, it, it doesn't matter which came first. What matters is that we are approachable, able to uh, empathize, provide support, and, and direct them to what is meaningful for them on their way to recovery. In terms of what the state is doing, the I, I will make a comment because I think the way we talk about um, interventions for substance use disorder now in the age of fentanyl are very different than when we used to talk about interventions in the age of heroin or oxycodone use. And that's because fentanyl is so much more potent. It acts more quickly than heroin or oxycodone. It, it is much more potent, about 50 to 100 times stronger. Um, and it also has to be used more frequently. So people have to use fentanyl multiple times a day. Um, they are very sick if they are using regularly and they're stopped. The withdrawal symptoms are horrific. Um, people want to avoid those. And people will develop an opioid use disorder much more quickly when they're using fentanyl. It used to take years when we were, you know, seeing folks who had heroin or, or uh, prescription opiate use disorder to develop severe dependence. Fentanyl, it can take a matter of months. So it, we have to think about how we respond and approach um, opioid use disorder, specifically in the age of fentanyl, a little bit differently. So I think the other thing we would point out is, is in the past, you know, we used to say 
if you need substance use disorder treatment, go to residential or intensive outpatient or outpatient treatment, um, and, and that will you know, be helpful. What we know now is the treatment of choice for fentanyl or opioid use disorder is medications first. People aren't gonna be successful in any other setting of treatment until they have medications to stabilize their biology, stabilize their brain chemistry, feel like they're present and you know, not craving opioids or feeling sick that they can then engage in whatever treatment they need. So, so I think it's important to point that out. The other thing I think is that what we're finding is that the, you know, people presenting with their substance use disorder, that's sort of a symptom, but often a lot of folks are using substances if they have mental health symptoms to treat them. If not, though, a lot of these folks have had significant trauma in their past. And so we have to respond in a trauma-informed way as we think about how to respond to people, both with mental health and substance use disorder issues. So what is the state doing? The, the legislature and governor's office have been really responsive to recognizing the need for funding. Um, the federal government has too. I could spend an hour talking about all the things that the state is doing for um, you know, helping to support and expand access to people, uh, access to care for people who have substance use disorders. I think from the crisis perspective, what you might be most interested in hearing that is the 23-hour crisis response centers. King County is set to open some in the next few days. That'll really give an opportunity for people to not necessarily show up in the emergency department, but people who are in crisis due to methamphetamine stimulant use, methamphetamine or stimulant use, or also um, from an opiate overdose or um, you know, opioid withdrawal can go there and, and be approached by folks who, who really deal with this every day and understand it. So I think those 23 hour crisis response centers will be really important. We also are doing a lot. There is funding for street medicine teams. There are funding for outreach teams. There are funding for non-traditional sites of care. Um, for the reason Dr. Owen said, folks with substance use disorders aren't treated well. They're discriminated against. They're treated poorly. Um, and, and this is even, you know, it's not just healthcare providers. It's the general public thinks differently about people with substance use disorder than mental health. So we want to try and create and support, particularly for folks with Medicaid, but really for anyone, low barrier barrier options so people can access and seek care in a place they're comfortable around people who they feel trusted or heard by and who are not judging them. So a lot of the legislative intent has been going for us to stand up model programs, health engagement hubs, like I said, street medicine teams, rapid induction from use of fentanyl onto other drugs, whether that's buprenorphine or methadone for stabilization and treatment of their opiate use disorder. So I think from a crisis perspective, those are, are important. Clearly um, making sure that naloxone is available um, for people who are using opioids, for friends or family members of people who are using opioids. We'll also be um, standing up some vending machines across the state that will provide naloxone and other items that people can just get when it's convenient for them to walk by. So um, I, I think it's probably more useful for me to respond to questions and continue to go on with all the stuff. But from a crisis perspective, I think those are one final thing I will add. Um, the Medicaid program renewed a, a, an additional five years of a transformation waiver. One of the pieces of that that we will, will be planning to stand up is something called stabilization centers. And those will be places where folks who may be feeling particularly agitated or just not well, but don't need to go to an emergency department from stimulant use or opiate use can go and be in a quiet place where they have peers, where they have supports, where they can be connected to other services um, so that they don't have to just be in a doorway or you know, taken by the police to jail. Or So that's probably coming in the next year and a half, but we have permission from uh, our federal partners to use Medicaid dollars to help support that work as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Potinos. That was a great overview. I'm going to turn it over to our panel now. I'm going to ask um, Chloe to help me pin everyone so that they're on the screen. And I will um, ask Alicia Morales to get us started. Lisa, you might be on mute. I am, and, and <laughs> I don't know how to turn my camera on, so I apologize. Hello, everybody. My name is Alicia Morales, and I will be assisting with the 
uh, panel today by moderating. So I appreciate your <clears throat> time and patience today. So as Jamie mentioned, um, there are some questions that we have for the panel. And so I'll just go ahead and get started with those. Um, so the first question is, <clears throat> what are the unique needs of people experiencing crisis related to substance use disorder and or co-occurring SUD and mental health conditions? And how, how are these needs different from uh, mental health specific crises? And I don't know if any one person in particular would like to start or I can take a chance at picking somebody. I would just kind of like draw back to my presentation. That's one of the questions I tried to address in my presentation. So stigma, the complex intersection between mental health uh, and substance use in both presentation and how they get uh, used together or um, show up together. Uh, the legality of S of many substances compared to uh, and how that introduces barriers to folks, as well as the lethality, obviously, of drugs compared to when folks are not using substances. Thank you, Dr. Owens. Does anyone else have anything to add? I, I would add one of the things that 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 we hear from some of our inpatient psychiatric hospitals is that when sometimes people will show up and they're not necessarily known to the system. So they may be hospitalized for the first time um, experienced in psychosis, and they may be put on an involuntary treatment hold. And then it can take a few days if that person has been using stimulants for a long time for them to clear from their system to realize really that, that, that they're not having a psychotic episode and they don't have an underlying mental health illness, but they do have a stimulant use disorder. So I think that's another way we hear people showing up that it's sometimes hard to tease out what exactly is the underlying problem um, without taking some time to, to sort of see what happens. Michael. Yeah, um, in my just recent experiences working MAT in support for the past almost two years is that um, a lot of crises will happen at the inception of person coming has previously been in MAT, MOUD treatment, or coming into and returning. The idea that um, they're not receiving that service in particular fast enough will begin to have people inside of episodes, like right off the bat inside of the facility. And so I think that um, we need to re-navigate and re-look at how we bring people into MOUD and how how quickly we do it. Um, I, I, I'm not really a big fan of the trickle up effect. I know that there's there's medical evidence that they, they you have to do it a certain way, but I just believe that um, addressing those person's needs as quickly as possible without the big weight in between and a, and a better way of monitoring and using peers or some other clinical staff to really begin to monitor that so we can get people into care and detoxification along with MAT at the same time. Thank you, Michael. And then Dr. Whiteside. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm answering this question from the perspective of my work as an emergency physician, and I work at Harborview Medical Center and the University of Washington Medical Center. So two, um, uh, both urban, academic, but very different clinical settings. And I think um, when I when I reflect back on patients that come in with um, either undiagnosed, that are all unknown to me as an emergency doc and have undiagnosed SUD or uh, mental health, but come in with, with a symptom that indicates a crisis that could be either. So um, the two uh, that I'm thinking is what I've heard in, from other speakers around um, agitation, um, uh, paranoia or, um, uh, you know, which are symptoms that could be consistent with methamphetamine intoxication or consistent with um, uh, um, psychiatric diagnosis and psychosis. And oftentimes they're overlapping. And our job is to sort of treat that with medications. Um, and, and we do that and we do that well, but um, once, once that patient is at a crisis, we're not often left with the right tools to treat the underlying disorder or even understand what the underlying disorder is. The other um, comorbidity that often um, occurs in our setting is a patient that comes in with opioid overdose. 
and we're really good at treating that um, and helping patients, supporting them through their overdose. Um, however, I think that we probably underdiagnose and underestimate the number of patients that have overdose with uh, some with comorbid depression, and and that is a suicide gesture, suicide attempt, in, in a way where um, uh, you know we sort of give them naloxone and harm reduction supplies, but we don't often address the underlying uh, mental health comorbidity of depression and suicide, um, and that opioid overdose is um, often a, a way of of um, sort of people showing us that they have those comorbidities. Thank you, Dr. Whiteside. And then Representative Davis? Yeah, a couple thoughts here. Um, so when I think about uh, what does a crisis look like in the context of somebody with a primary substance use disorder, so often those uh, crises are precipitated by a loss of some kind, uh, often a loss uh, that is a consequence of the person's continued addiction. So things like loss of a relationship, um, loss of a relationship with an intimate partner or with a family member, uh, loss of a job, loss of employment uh, related to their substance use, loss of housing. Uh, one of the things that I have, that's always, um, I found very problematic in this space is um, the professions of, of tough love and the, the, it's, it, the advice is given with the best intentions, but that's, you know, 40 or 50 years ago rhetoric, but people are said, you know, tough love, kick them out. And I, I, there's an untold number of suicides that have occurred immediately after a person was kicked out of their housing because you lose two things. You lose your relationship with your family and your housing. Uh, and just understanding that uh, the, you know, people use drugs because they don't want to experience the present because the present is too painful. That is why they're using drugs. And uh, I mean, there's this, this, baseline level of not necessarily, it can be acute suicidality, but this uh, baseline level of despair that is always there. And that is what they're, that's why they're using. Um, a couple other things that can precipitate crises is, you know, system interactions, right? So some, for some people, uh, the moment of arrest uh, can be a crisis of sorts. Um, in so many ways, it, it to, to be arrested, uh, to be handcuffed, to be uh, put in a cage, just amplifies the feelings of being less than and being other so too does being kicked out of your house or, or loss of job or uh, broken up with by your partner, all of these things. Uh, you know, th there is no individual who hates a person in active addiction more than that person themselves. That, that would be impossible. And uh, so anything that adds to that. Uh, one uh, drug that we haven't uh, talked about as much is alcohol. Um, so I, I think about the interaction of uh, alcohol and crises in two ways. Um, so al alcohol amplifies emotions. And so if you have a, this person with this underlying despair, alcohol can just make acute all of those feelings of loss, both in the past and the present, and bring them to the surface immediately Perfect. and uh, bring lots of tears and lots of uh, suicidality. And then the other piece is, uh, you know, I think for anyone on the call, I know we have a lot of experts here, but people who don't work in SUD, the... Um, you know, people, we think of uh, drugs as as uppers and downers, as stimulants and depressants, and alcohol and opioids, uh, those, benzodiazepines, those are depressants, uh, things like uh, nicotine and, and um, psychostimulants, cocaine, methamphetamine, uh, those are uppers. And often people who have a baseline level of anxiety uh, and, and uh, who would clinically qualify for generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder like downers because they, they they bring down that anxiety at least momentarily they're actually quite effective but it ends up being this sort of chasing your own tail type of thing because people end up having alcohol induced panic attacks and they end up having panic attacks that they wouldn't have had because their alcohol their blood alcohol gets too low and so we see those type of individuals present to the emergency department also uh another thing i'll mention um is uh that 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 really the, the the pervasive symptom in somebody who's in active addiction is is hopelessness. And I talked about despair, and those are intertwined. But that's really important. I used to work in suicide prevention for a living. I worked at Forefront Suicide Prevention, and one of my frustrations when I was involved with our our national industry association, the American Association of Suicidology, is suicidal suicide. Uh, behavior was considered sort of in the mental health realm, but the overlap between substance use disorder and suicide is astounding. Uh, there is a significant uh, percentage of uh, suicide decedents uh, who are 
tox positive for drugs or alcohol, but just in general, people who are who have a substance use disorder, uh, in part because of all of these other factors uh, leading to this precipitation of losses, they're incredibly high risk for suicide and uh, and die by suicide at, at alarmingly high rates. And I, I do think we need to focus uh, more on that. And there's a, a Dr. Rick Rees at Harvard Review does a lot of, he has a whole presentation on the gray line between what is an overdose and what is a suicide attempt. Thank you, Representative Davis, and then Dr. Bettinos. Yeah, thank thank you, Representative Davis. Very well said. Uh, I, I just wanted to respond to to Michael's points. I, one of the other things I would point out about opiate use disorder in the age of fentanyl is that because fentanyl is so much stronger and has to be used multiple times a day and takes a long time to clear from a person's body, the, the sort of scientific community is still trying to figure out what's the best way to treat people who are using fentanyl. Um, you know, we first started saying, well, we have to do this slow transition. And now people are saying, well, that's not, that's hard for somebody who's afraid for days that they're might going to go into significant withdrawal to keep trusting their, you know, nurse practitioner or their doctor who's saying, just hang in there, hang in there when you're living on the street. And, and you you don't feel safe. That's hard to do. So I was just on a call this morning and we have some funding from the legislature to look at ways in which we can more quickly get people transitioned from fentanyl to either buprenorphine, whether that's short acting or long acting or methadone and some funding to really try some pilots to say, how can we do this quickly so we can get people as medically and clinically stable and emotionally stable from that craving and, and fear of withdrawal as quickly as we can. So then they can tell us what else they need. Is it that they need to talk about that loss? Is it they need to talk about their hopelessness? Is it they need housing, right? When people are in crisis, they, they, we should not expect them to be able to sit calmly and tell us what they need. So our first, you know, intervention is how do we get people stable? And so we, we, lots of conversations throughout the medical community. How do we do this? What are you doing? How are you trying it? This, we don't know yet how to do a lot of great work in the Harborview ER, um, doing some rapid transitions for folks. So we're learning um, and uh, it, it, it's new, but we have to react as quickly as we can. And, and again, thank you, uh, Rep Davis, for your work in the legislature and the governor and, and providing us some starting funds to really get this stuff moving and say, how do we do this quickly? Thank you, Dr. Patinos, and I think that really beautifully ties into the second question, which is given the differences between the substance use and co-occurring crises versus a behavioral health, uh, mental health crises, what are the implications for the behavioral health crisis system? In other words, how do we approach the crisis response? In, um, sorry, how do we need to approach crisis response system improvements to address substance use disorders and co-occurring disorder? I think for starters, and it and it uh, kind of revisiting what has already been said is that um, for efficacy, we have to address, have the ability to address that over seventy percent of persons contacted and engaged, that they have the ability to immediately have the need addressed in a triage manner, but also ready to do um, to receive. A, medicated treatment for opioid use. I'm speaking specifically of opioid use disorder because it's most prevalent, but that, that needs to be at the ready as, as part of the whole for crisis response teams and mobile teams and et cetera. They, I'm not sure that right now we're approaching it as prepared to deal with, right? It's prepared to deal with, and oh, by the way, let's get another car and move them down the road and we'll get that addressed too. Right. Um, the idea and for logistics and um, potency purposes, I'll give it up for those that don't really have an idea of the potency and the need for a late stage fentanyl addict. It would be the distance of walking from the courthouse to airport way and Holgate. If a person needs to walk that far and they're in late stage use, chronic use, they will need, if they were on foot, they will need to use, I've calculated it, they would need to use three and a half times in that distance of walking just to, that's just to make it to that doorway and get medication. 
if that is interrupted and they're not able to use that somewhere in between that idea, there may be an episode of desperation that is standing in traffic. That's throwing a rock through a window. That is accosting people for not giving change for that extra $2 in order to make that happen. And so and that's where, that's the reason I really wanted this panel to happen today. So we get a real understanding of how that, that intersection of actual crises um, can happen like that. Dr. Owens, thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, you know, what I kind of said in my slides is really just though thinking about and trans either tr transforming our system or for building new systems, that it's substance use and behavioral health. I was a substance use disorder counselor and I, I didn't know how to help people's mental health. And now I'm at the level where I can do both. Um, and it's just that huge disconnect between only being able to treat one or the other. It's not just when I sit down with the individual, can I now take care of the whole person? Um, because I have training in both substance use and mental health, but it's also our systems being literally physically separated that our, our folks are feeling that. And like Michael said, right, if there's this much distance to literally walk between that, then that's a huge, even bigger distance. And then just even the mentality within our system that we are somehow separate. I put in like medical in there too, right? That that, that is somehow a medical problem. This is a drug problem. This is a behavioral problem when rather this is a, a human a human being in front of us. And so if we can really build that system with that perspective, then I think our folks will feel it. Thank you, Dr. Owens. And I apologize, I'm not sure between Dr. Whiteside and Dr. Patinas who had their hand up first. Dr. Whiteside. Thank you. Dr. Whiteside. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I think what Michael said was really important and, and especially, um, uh, you know, the experience that I see for patients who are using fentanyl and have obedience disorder that are in the ED for whatever reason, and the majority of them are not there seeking treatment um, and they are not wanting to be there because when you're in the ED, you're, you're not able to uh, keep yourself well. And you're, you're met often with stigma and you're met with, um, a system that is um, oftentimes, even in the best of intentions, ill-equipped to handle um, a substance use disorder. And so if you find yourself needing, you know, it, with a medical crisis or an injury or some reason in the ED, it, it, I find the, the feeling I get from patients is often terrified around um, going to withdrawal and use. And, and so then patients are using the bathroom or using the hallways or um, other things. And it can be hard to get through an ED visit for chest pain or, you know, broken wrist or whatever. Um, and also uh, being able for that person to then take care of themselves um, in a way where they can feel okay. And so emergency departments um, need, need to be able to handle um, comorbid substance use disorder, and in this case, opioid use disorder from the beginning. And so how we're identifying patients um, from triage, how patients are being met in our emergency department. I think the emergency department is a really important healthcare location because the lights are always on and we're always available and there's a warm bed and a sandwich and a, and a, a place to be. Um, it can also be a very um, not trauma-informed care location and can be difficult to navigate for patients and people are often faced with people who are um, uh, unfamiliar or unwilling um, to care for those um, comorbidities that can impact care for um, acute care crisis. Um, similarly, I think um, we sort of, uh, um, I think uh, what I heard Dr. Owens and Michael also say is like we as healthcare providers need to get comfortable being outside of the walls of our um, healthcare locations. And I guess I would um, look to others and I'm, I, you know, I know Dr. Dr. Fortino, as you talked about this, but street, street medicine, how can we bring what we can do well, um, say in the emergency department where we're really good at um, getting, um, being uh, uh, creative and, and sort of we're generalists, we can take on acute medical care, substance use crisis, and a behavioral health crisis. But how can we bring that into communities so that patients don't have to walk those uh, miles or pass through those, um, you know, pass through the doors where they might feel unwelcome? How can we bring more to community um, and where people are, I think is really important. Thank you, Dr. Whiteside and Dr. Patinos. 
Yeah, I think I think as I mentioned, there are a lot of initiatives. Um, there are there is funding. Um, and I'm going to get to. I know it in King County, Everett, uh, Tacoma, Kittitas, or Kitsap. There is some um, directed funding we'll be giving to five sites in the state to either build or develop street medicine teams. Um, it, I I just a, an aside. I I. It, it's really rewarding for me to hear people engaging street medicine. 20 years ago, I was developed a mobile medical program and we were out doing this. It was heroin at the time, right? So it wasn't nearly as intense as it is now, but um, it, it, if we treat people poorly and they're not going to seek care, they're not, they're not going to feel like they have permission to ask for help. And so I think going to them is really important. The Downtown Emergency Services Center in Seattle, they're doing some really cool outreach. A lot of folks around the state are, are going to people in encampments under bridges where they are and, and trying to reestablish some trust with them so they can feel like someone cares about them. So I think I agree, we, we need to build those. Um, I did want to say one of the things that we're thinking about from the Healthcare Authority Medicaid system side is that I think we have to train everyone to be able to respond to both basic mental health conditions and substance use disorders. It is rare that someone with any type of substance use disorder doesn't have some history of trauma, some PTSD, anxiety, as, as Rep Davis mentioned, depression. We all have to be able to recognize and address that. And and you know we think about behavioral health crisis, and there's certainly clearly suicide, which is suicidal thinking, which is urgent. But there are people with serious mental illness who also use substances for a lot of the reasons we've talked about. So really, I think we we can't continue to separate these out as two separate things. They are they are um, conditions where someone's thinking ability to manage their life is not stable. And whether it's from an underlying mental health or an underlying substance use disorder, their ability to manage and think clearly is impaired. So we as, as healthcare providers broadly in whatever discipline we call ourselves need to recognize you can't separate those out. We are, you know, we're all, we, we all go together. And so how do we move the system to really be co-occurring? And, and to not say, well, if you have this, you go here first, and then you go, that that's not patient-centered. That just traumatizes people even more. So how do we work together to, to get everybody trained up for basic intervention skills, which you know everybody can learn. You don't have to go to medical school, learn basic intervention schools. Dr. Owen's shaking her head. Yeah, we can do a lot. Thank you, Dr. Patinos, Representative Davis. Yeah, so a couple things, um, but before I get into the, this question, I do want to mention one thing uh, that I should have said on question one, just regarding the differences I know we're talking about, and it should absolutely be just places that um, support and, and treat individuals in behavioral health crisis, whatever the, the nature of the crisis. But one thing for folks who are a little bit less familiar with, with SUD, that is, I think, distinct in some ways uh, from mental health crises, is the ability, and Dr. Patina has talked about this, but the ability to stabilize a patient and remit symptoms using polypharmacy, using medications, you can do that much more quickly with a patient with substance use disorder than you can remit depression or organic psychosis. It, it, I'm not, to keep that disease in remission requires recovery support services and a whole bunch of other things, but the actual literal like removal of the symptoms can occur much more quickly on the SUD side of the house. It can, not always. Uh, so something to think about. Um, and I also just want to note, this is true for mental health as well, but particularly for folks with substance use disorder, crisis is very often the, the window of opportunity into care uh, that because it's an interruption. For whatever reason, it's, a, it's an interruption of the daily use cycle, either because they're in an ED or because they're intoxicated or because they got kicked out of their home or because they lost their job. There is some interruption inter event that has occurred and that is an opportunity um, for intervention, I think probably more true with SUD than with people with a primary mental health challenge, you have a window of willingness uh, to get somebody into care and it is brief and fleeting. And that that is especially true. You've got to get people in before that window eclipses. A uh, couple things about what the system should look like. So uh, for me, it starts with workforce. I, um, I hope the comments I'm about to say um, 
don't offend folks, but uh, the vast majority of mental health professionals know very little to nothing about substance use disorder. And that's not really their own fault because they weren't trained that way and they're still not trained that way. Mental health counselors, licensed marriage and family therapists, social workers. I used to teach at the master's program at the UW School of Social Work. There's two SUD classes and they're electives. They're not compulsory. Uh, so we are training up a workforce of mental health professionals who know nothing. They're not required to know anything about SUD. And to be honest, they're woefully unprepared to treat this population. I mean, I've heard so many stories of sticking a mental health professional in front of an SUD IOP group, an intensive outpatient group setting, and the MHP leaves the room crying like they can't handle it. There's the, uh, and, you know, I'll just say like, not to speak in broad strokes or stereotypes, but like, there's a certain there's a whole lexicon that goes along with people who use drugs and alcohol. There's like a certain way of being. There's maybe some more rough around the edges that you may see possibly as a group more than in the mental health population. And just that kind of cultural competency, if you will, to understand this population is absent from uh, most of our uh, mental health clinicians. There's specific therapeutic modalities that are good in general, but they're especially prudent for uh, SUD. And it's not just for clinicians, but motivational interviewing in particular is particularly important for patients with SUD. And you can, peers can do that. Uh, clinicians can do that, but um, but getting people along in those sort of stages of change is, is especially needed. Um, the importance of peers, that's obviously true for both mental health and SUD. Um, but but I, like back to the workforce understanding, um, I mean, people with SUD are, there are some different things that one needs to understand working with this population. People with substance use disorder lie, maybe more than, and, and it's important to understand that because it's important to understand what they're saying and how that, and not, I don't say that to perpetuate stigma in any way, but but um, people with SUD can pull the wool over the eyes of clinicians if, people, if the clinicians don't understand uh, drug-seeking behavior, as an example. Particularly prescribers uh, can end up prescribing uh, dangerous medications uh, to patients because they don't understand that, that person's uh, drug-seeking behavior. And just a baseline understanding of that singular focus of, of getting high and what that is is like and what that experience is like uh, also, just noting that people with um, SUD chronically experience an incredible amount of ambivalence. It is never true that at any one point in time that a person in active addiction has zero interest in getting help. That's never that's never the case. It might be 1%, and then the next day it might be 25, and then it might be 75, but it's never zero. And, and the day that they walk into treatment, it's also not 100. There's this incredible amount of ambivalence, and people can, it's, it can be fleet, people can leave. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'll mention is about civil commitment. Uh, so we talked about that. Um, so Ricky's Law is the state's civil commitment for substance use disorder provision. Um, it is uh, wildly effective for people who've received care under it and wildly underutilized. Uh, tragically, we all know there's no shortage of people uh, who would meet the legal threshold for involuntary treatment for substance use disorder, uh, grave disability, harm to self or others. And yet half of our Ricky's Law beds every night for the last six years since the bill went into effect have been empty. And that is largely, uh, not exclusively, but largely the fault of the emergency departments and the hospitals because a designated crisis responder cannot detain a patient they were never called to evaluate. And 75% of all detentions occur in the emergency department. So if an ED who says, they say things to me like, we have real medical patients to attend to, if they call the DCR, they're stuck with that patient for another six to 12 hours and they don't want to be. So it's Narcan and bye-bye. Uh, and uh, with all due respect to my emergency department colleague who's on the panel, but it, it happens all the time. And so uh, one of the provisions in Senate Bill 6228 that passed requires every three years uh, training for emergency department social workers in uh, civil commitment statutes and what uh, what how it looks like when a person meets a clinical criteria for detention who has a primary substance use disorder. So that's uh, a new training and new law that will go into effect uh, when the governor signs that bill tomorrow. Thank you, Representative Davis. And then in closing, just a very brief, um, so the CRIS is developing recommendations for performance metrics to measure crisis system improvement. As we continue developing these, what is one key takeaway about SUD or substance use disorder that you'd like for the CRIS to consider? Yes, I would just encourage thinking about uh, the array of services that people could engage in from lower T to capital T, like it's not just residential or outpatient care, but also harm reduction services. Thank you, Dr. Owens. 
I think it, it would be good, and, and maybe this is already part of the, the plan, but I think that anyone calling in, in crisis, however they define it, or their friend calling for someone in crisis, is the question asked, you know, in, in, a, in a thoughtful and respectful way, it is, are, is this person also using substances? Could that also be a part of, of you know, a concern? And, and I think there need to be some, you know, careful wording to make that respectful but but I, I think again not just we, we don't know what to to how to help folks if we don't know what they're dealing with so I think just figuring out how to ask that safely and respectfully would be helpful thank you dr Patinos and dr Whiteside yeah um I think uh I think identification seems um really important for step I'll also say I think understanding the a, mat, a, a good match of who the workforce is that's um, that's sort of identifying um, and and helping patients in crisis. I think um, uh, I heard Rep Davis say that a majority of these, you know, there there is a good majority of patients in crisis in the emergency department. Um, I, uh, the emergency department is staffed with physicians, nurses, social workers. Um, how can we um, support a workforce of uh, navigators? peer support specialists, um, other folks that can um, that can do uh, some of this work um, as well to help the the to help those um, clinicians that are doing um, this work and other things. And so um, I, I guess I'd, wa I'd wonder a little bit about a workforce, uh, making sure that we have um, enough of a workforce to uh, and making sure that that's being measured and it, it's not just a physician task. Thank you, Dr. Whiteside. Michael or Representative Davis, do either of you want to include a takeaway? Uh, I mean, the, the, the takeaway specific to metrics, is that the question? So, yes. Yeah, so how can we, since the CRISC is tasked with looking at performance metrics, how do we include substance use disorder in the performance metrics that we're looking at when we're talking about improving the crisis system. Yeah, I mean, I think just ca ca data capture, right, on your population of uh, people who identify or are diagnosed with a, a primary substance use disorder. Um, a lot of people self-identify as such, um, uh, people's drug choice uh, and uh, capturing that. And also the um, the the sort of the, the the care centers from which uh, the referrals derive, right? Whether that's emergency department, law enforcement interaction, et cetera. Um, and I think and my hope would be that there'd be some mechanism for continual uh, feedback loops uh, from system users, both mental health and SUD. Uh, but, uh, you know, particularly folks at SUD will, will not be shy about giving uh, suggestions for improvement on uh, how something could be better. Thank you, Representative Davis. And Michael, I see you come up with mute. Yeah, I just I just think it's important for and, and as Rep Davis said earlier, um the the idea that um the support the support where is the support actually coming from from initially? That interruption um although periodic and she described it as fleeting. It, it this is um crisis intervention can be that maybe that one up that roll of the dice it might be and how and how safe and supportive is that interruption right is it um we d crisis centers can't have that that carceral odor to it that can sometimes happen without um having peers and um the newer minded mental health professionals Hopefully, as Rep. Davis described, fully trained, prepared, schooled, and um, dealing directly with the affected population instead of reading it through text. Right? We would hope that um, that that happens. Um, for my my own experience, the metric that I think that needs to start happening is we instead of we have a real habit within the last six years of describing how important peers are and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but we're not including the peer cog wheel in the mechanism. They're just like kind of on the peripheral, they matter, but they, 
this might be a little heavy lifting for you there, Michael. When we get over there, then we'll, we'll include some peer work and support when we get there. But that initial, when we're talking about this population that's described today, you don't have a better person than somebody like myself or, or lived experience to walk into a camp, a doorway, walk up to somebody holding a bottle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in those conditions, because under the influence of a substance is actually a piece of the crisis, right? It's manifested it is an actual crisis. And there, you don't, we need to really begin to include in the on-ramp of these services, peers and, um, and how that we have the direct line of experience and the way to address the vernacular, the posture, the ability to find people, et cetera, et cetera, and to walk into these spaces and then begin to deliver safely a warm handoff into these services. Um, or or these crisis centers could, in, if not staffed correctly, could end up being a wreck, to say the least, if we're not careful. Um, that's all. I just think that, uh, like, data collection in the right way needs to, needs to happen and, and to be shared. And, uh, and to be shared so that everybody's getting a look at it on a consistent basis, because uh, from the time this Chris committee came about, and, and there's many on the screen who can attest to this, we didn't really have to talk so much about this subject. We could have, but it really wasn't leaning so far. We were really concerned. Now you, we don't have a choice, but to, it, it's here. It's here, and, and, and here's the deal. The way, that, the way that policy is right now, we're not gonna be able to avoid it much anymore. It's going to have to be part of the conversation from here on out and how we address and meet these two um, pillars together. That's all. Thank you, Michael, very much. And I just want to say thank you all very much for your time and your willingness to share and have this discussion because it is very important. And I appreciate the opportunity to allow me to moderate this. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Jamie. Alicia, thank you so much for jumping in and moderating this. I also want to thank the panel, but before I do, um, we have about three minutes left and Rep Orwell wanted to say something and maybe had a quick question. I also want to mention I have a number of wonderful questions from our Chris members that we're not going to have time to get answered. Um, but but panelists, if you don't mind, if, if you wouldn't mind me sharing some of those questions with you at, at your at your convenience, if, if you have thoughts, um, I can relay them back to the Chris and the community. Um, so I will pause now and ask Rep Orwell to speak. Thank you. And I, I just want to start with a huge thank you. This is an incredibly important conversation. This is a rock star panel. I want to thank you all for being here today. I have to do a special shout out to Rep Davis, who's our leader in the caucus on these issues. So thank you. Michael, I really appreciate what you just said. When we went down to Arizona to the 23-hour facilities, they were greeted by peers, right? They were the in the forefront of the service. So the question I have for you is, as we're thinking about the 23-hour centers, the crisis relief, how do we configure them to have really, I, I heard the term, you know, co-occurring capability, but it really needs to be beyond that. Like, how do we truly make them a no-wrong door for people with substance use? And is there a way to, tr like, fast-track people into the system like we used to do historically when substance use was more centralized screened? Thank you. I can jump here in here as a facilitator. Um, so we, we probably have like just a minute or two if one of you has a, a thought on that and I wants to jump in and otherwise I can compile Representative Orwell's question with some of the other questions that um, Chris members have asked and send them along to you via email. I'd be happy to share some ideas with Rep Orwell too um, about this since we are gonna be helping to figure out how to pay for all this and we can do requirements and stuff. So happy to continue this conversation. I think it's a really important question. Thank you so much, Dr. Patinas. Any other thoughts that anyone wants to share before we, we uh, close out? Rep, Rep Davis. Yeah, just three things super quickly. Uh, one would be 
peers, right, who who uh, represent uh, people with lived experience of SUD specifically, and then train clinicians on the floor within that, that living room model. Uh, the second one would be medication capable, ideally to include methadone. So not everything but methadone for fentanyl is often the best medicine that we have. And so having a relationship with an opioid treatment program uh, to be able to dispense on site or becoming a fixed medication site, uh, but also having buprenorphine, also having uh, medications for alcohol use disorder uh, and and uh, starting patients on that. And then um, thinking out of the box, so things like ambulatory detox or how do you, person comes over 23 hours, can they leave? And then um, perhaps withdrawal management at home with supervision of somebody. And then finally a referral pathways, right? So do we have referral pathways uh, that are well-worn and established for uh, opiate treatment program for methadone, for withdrawal management, for residential SUD, for uh, buprenorphine or, you know, suboxone outpatient, all of those things. All right. Thanks, Rep. Davis. Michael, if you have something really quick, please jump in and then we'll yeah. wrap up. Yes. Um, revamping and creating an auxiliary training for peers and auxiliary staff that deals directly with the newfound um, approach to crisis. Um, some of the curriculum is really outdated and archaic. Thanks. All right. I just want to say echo again uh, what Alicia and Representative Orwell said. Thank you so much. I'm getting notes in my chat here from Chris members saying how much they appreciated this conversation and heard this is one of the best Chris meetings we've had. So panelists, thank you so much for all of your preparation. Alicia, thank you so much for moderating that panel. Michael, thank you for getting us to do this. This has been really wonderful um, and I think very informative. Chris members, we're gonna take a break until 1.10 and then we're gonna come back and group process. Panelists, if you are free and you'd like to stay, we'd love to have you. I know you're all very busy, so please you know, go and do the next thing you have to do. But if you wanna stay and, and, and chat with Chris about how they what they learned from this conversation and what's next, you are welcome to stay. We'll all be back on cameras at 1.10 p.m. Um, and then Chris members, you can send your questions in the chat and we'll compile them and send them out to the panel if they have um, thoughts that they would want to share later on. So thank you everyone. We'll see you in, at 1.10.
Okay, I think folks are starting to trickle back in. Cool, if you could take down the break, perfect. All right. And Chris, committee members, as you come back, if you wouldn't mind turning on your video camera, if that's available to you, that'll help me see that you're back and ready to talk. Okay, welcome back everyone. So I'm gonna queue up. Uh, so now we're gonna do a little bit of group processing of what we learned in the presentation and panel discussion we just had. Um, and the first question, I'm, I'm kind of hoping to do something we don't usually do, which is a round robin. I'd love to hear from each Chris committee member, if you're willing, um, what your uh, biggest takeaway from the panel discussion was. What made you think as you walked away? And you are welcome to do this uh, verbally, or you can put it in the chat. But if you can give that question a little bit of thought and be ready to share it with the larger group. Um, I'd love to hear from you again. What was your biggest takeaway from that presentation and panel discussion? And I can start by asking for a volunteer to raise your hand to kick it off. Um, or I can start by calling on one of you. So let's see, let's see if we have a volunteer to raise your hand first. Dylan, I can always count on you. Dylan, what was your biggest takeaway? Hi. Um... Dylan Nishimoto, he, him pronouns with Asian Counseling and Referral Service. Uh, the I'm I'm a social, also a clinical social worker. I um, mean, I agree with the statement around the the need for additional training for mental health professionals and just across the board for everyone that is engaging with, um, really anyone that might be in a crisis situation. So, um, and I was also thinking about the mental health first aid training that is available and widely available. I haven't taken it myself, but I am curious about uh, what level of substance use disorder training is included in that mental health first aid training. And if not, maybe there is some room to expand or improve on that. Thank you. So Dill, it sounds like what really spoke to you in particular was talking about the workforce and the training that they received to address substance use disorder. Um, and thanks for bringing up the mental health first aid training too. That makes perfect sense. Kristen. I've actually taken the mental health first aid training and they did not really cover substance use disorder at all. So um, either including that in mental health first aid or making a substance use first aid training that could be wildly available would be super beneficial. Um, in addition to my lived experience, I'm also a licensed social worker and I definitely want to reflect about that lack of training for substance use disorder. Uh, in my role as a social worker, I do ITA assessments and I feel like I definitely need to be more knowledgeable about uh, Ricky's law and the differences between uh, detainment for mental health and the detainment for substance use under Ricky's law. Thanks, Kristen. Anna? For me, it just reconfirms the stories that I've heard from so many family members and so many individuals who had the co-occurring um, both substance use and mental health treatment. And, um, you know, the stories I hear about how they're almost forced to uh, choose between getting substance use treatment or mental health treatment. And there's a lot of barriers when it comes to uh, treating co-occurring uh, you know, those co-occurring symptoms and or co-occurring conditions. And so um, I think it just re-clarifies re the need to acknowledge the co-occurring conditions and to, you know, find ways to, to reduce those barriers. I mean, even someone, you know, for me, a personal experience um, when I was um, in, you um, a, a mental hospital and I had friends that were in there are people that became my friends while I was in there and they were told they couldn't continue to get treatment unless they weren't on drugs anymore and so they chose homelessness because they and it was it, it was just heartbreaking and so I'm just really glad that we're we're finally getting this work done Thanks, Anna, and thanks for raising that issue that was discussed in the panel about the the almost parallel systems that aren't 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 working for people. 
Representative Orwell. Thank you. And again, it was just an excellent panel. I think my aha moment is even our, our new planning, like our 23 hour crisis centers. Um, I don't know that we've we've really figured out how to bring all these components together to truly have a no wrong door and to have the linkages we need for people after they're there that really tie to kind of the array of needs around co-occurring. And, you know, the 16 involuntary detox beds are in my unit and they, they're they sitting empty. <laughs> and I can't imagine that there's not an enormous need. And so maybe our 23 hour centers will be one of those resources that can help get people the care they need. Thanks, Rep Orwell. <clears throat> Alicia. Hello, my name is again, Alicia Morales, and I am, I co-manage a behavioral health crisis team within the city of Tacoma that dispatches through 911. And so I think a part for me that was really impactful to hear um, was the acknowledgement of the, the need for collaboration because the my team supports people who have called or a community member has called into the 911 system and so there's a possibility that they and they're having some interaction with a traditional first responder and so we are then engaging with them and it could be a, a behavioral health or mental health call or it could be related to substance use and so we're coordinating with the traditional first responders within the 911 system, as well as the hospital, and just how can we all work together in supporting each other and doing that work and um, identifying the, the different types of professionals that are in each setting and what is in their scope of practice and really understanding what resources they have available, because I think that that is just as important. And so I just want to, um, like, knowing how each system works. If somebody goes to the emergency department, the social worker may not actually see that person ever. It might just be the the medical doctor that sees them and then decides, well, this is substance use. They've met with their metabolizing to freedom. They go back out into the community. That social worker doesn't have an opportunity to engage. So I think when we're talking about workforce development and training and education, it needs to be at all levels of who might interact with a person in crisis, whether it's behavioral health or substance use. And regardless of whether it's a traditional 911 um, call or like the new 988 or regional crisis line. Thank you so much, Alicia. Yeah, I'm 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 hearing what you're saying. Not it it it's about both having all parts of the system trained and then having them know each other and work together and more collaboratively for 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 better treatment. Um, Darcy. Yeah, um, a few things that occurred to me as I was listening. Uh, number one was how excited I was that we're having this conversation. It's been something that I've been uh, working on my whole career. Um, the one comment that really um, I wanted to applaud extra was, I think Mandy said it, um, was this idea that, you know, as we think about this conceptually, we think about this as health and not mental health, substance use, and health, that really in this particular, um, we would see that people that have a substance use um, disorder by the data that Mandy showed almost always also have a mental health disorder. But I will, but my own um, experience working in the hospitals and the EDs is they almost always have a health condition as well. And so if we can really start to think about this as the whole person, even though I also agree with, uh, with what someone earlier said, we have developed structural systems that make it really hard to do that. And so, um, we have a lot to learn as practitioners, but our system doesn't make that easy. And so I would hope we would take advantage of that opportunity. I'm definitely hearing a theme about this being a systems problem and maybe illuminating some, some of those challenges that we need to address in our system improvement. So thank you, Darcy. Chief Harding. Uh, one big takeaway. I I can't remember exactly who said it, but uh, someone pointed out the fentanyl withdrawal is very severe and it's painful. And that is something that we've anecdotally experienced with um, with people that we've dealt with telling us, you know, they're afraid. And it sometimes will drive behaviors to avoid contact with law enforcement um, if they have a court date or they know they have a warrant and maybe we're just doing a traffic stop. Sometimes that will drive 
you know, behavior for them to get away based on fear. So to, to somehow affect that with quick treatment and medication to reduce that level of anxiety and fear, I think is important. I really appreciate that too, from the perspective of, of a first responder. So thanks for sharing that, Chief Harding. I've got, oh, Bipasha. Okay, so I think this is one of the best press meetings. Can I just be plain speaking? I think the panel was excellent and they spoke in plain language, which is a lot easier to absorb for me and the community rather than very often the ivory tower language that comes with professionals all due respect to professionals. Um, I echo the workforce development issue and professionals being trained in SUD along with mental health. It was good to hear from about what the state is doing. I loved hearing about the street medicine and yet we know it's nearly not enough. I am also a crisis um, counselor on the crisis line and I have a question. I take calls from people who are dealing with the substance use disorder issue but there, I also hear from family and friends, loved ones. And so we as a system need to, we're trying to build a system that meets everybody where they are. And um, Rep Davis talked about, you know, the old fashioned tough love thing um, where people often lose their homes because, with their family because, but, but how do we honor the need of the person who is going through the substance use issue and how do we also honor the families who are maybe many times un feeling unsafe in their own homes? They both need to be, they needs to be met and the system needs to look at the, that thing holistically. So that was something that really jumped out for me. So interesting that you raised that, Bipasha. I had the same question in my head when I was listening. So I, I, I appreciate you raising that. Um, note in the chat here from Dylan too, um, he may, don't think we heard mention of the family initiated treatment during the panel, which allows a parent or guardian to bring their child that's above the age of consent for minors for behavioral health services, 13, but below the age of adulthood, 18 years old. And I think you're right, Dylan. I don't think we did talk about that in the panel. Um, Bipasha. Oh, and I forgot to mention, we didn't talk about youth at all. And I, I'm saying this, it's mm -hmm. not Kashi saying this, I keep feeling like, why do we not address youth issues? Um, because that also overlaps with family issues, you know, very yes. similar, but different when someone's a minor versus an adult, but still family member. I think I wish I'd heard that part more in this presentation. Bipasha, it won't surprise you that the question I got from Kashi was exactly that. So um that will be a follow-up, I think. Um, and thank you for the feedback on the panel. I, I saw a couple of other chats from folks who would love to see more of that. So um, I appreciate you raising that. Puck. Um, thank you everyone on the panel. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanna speak to uh, substance use as a barrier to most places folks access care, um, housing, but also you, the the idea that you have to be a certain amount of sober to access most services that we have, um, I think is a big, a big challenge. So I'm really glad that we're talking about it. Um, I've noticed in my own world with people I care about who use substances, this perception that I am too soft to participate in supporting that. Um, I, I brought someone to talk about his crisis previously, and now he lives at an Oxford house, and he is nervous for me around his housemates, even though they are sober, even though they are trying to live their best lives. He seems to have this perception of me that I am too gentle of a person somehow to engage with his housemates, um, not for my safety, but for my like capacity and cultural consciousness. And I think that there's almost a cultural competency issue, I think, where the mental health field can be actually or perceived as very feelings-based. And I think sometimes substance use is about not feeling those feelings. And so I think that there is something that could be helpful to look at there about this kind of 
perceived and actual lack of cultural competence between some mental health providers and some substance situations. Oh, thanks so much for raising that. And that certainly, I think, echoes some of what we heard in the panel discussion today about competency. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Snowden. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, I would start by saying I second the comment that Darcy made about the importance of recognizing that mental health substance use problems don't live in a vacuum separate from overall health and physical health conditions. Uh, and if we really want no wrong doors, we've got to have those doors able to deal with that medical physical health need as well. Uh, if I had an aha moment during the piano, I think it was spurred by a comment that Rep. Davis made. Uh, I never thought about the, the connection between lack of use of secure withdrawal beds and time to DCR responding to ERs and therefore ERs deciding not to refer for involuntary treatment. Um, but based on the comments also made about the differences in time uh, to resolution of symptoms that come from substance use problems, uh, it makes me think that maybe the system really is still designed more on the mental health uh, ITA needs than the substance use needs, and that maybe what we need to do is to figure out a, a way to have DCRs either in the EDs or more rapidly able to respond to the EDs if that time thing is really the barrier uh, to what I think is a really valuable resource in terms of uh, beds for people to go to. Thank you for raising that, Dr. Snow. And I'm sorry that that Laura Pippen had to step out early today. She'd had a previously scheduled um, commitment when she was appointed to this committee. But I think um, in particular, I think she would have been interested to hear that comment. So we'll make sure to relay that to her. Um, I think I've heard from most of you. There's a few folks left who haven't spoken yet. Um, remaining Chris committee members, anything, any takeaways you want to share or echo from what 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 you've heard from your colleagues. That's okay, I won't, I won't force you to talk. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna queue up my next question, which is, um, and, and I think Nicola shared this in the meeting materials, but reflecting back on the guiding principles and proposals for metrics that we talked about at our last Chris meeting, in February and what we're gonna queue up again for talking about in April. Based on what you learned today about SUD and your takeaways, excuse me, what else should we um, add or consider to better address substance use disorder? You've heard some practical proposals. Dr. Snowden just offered one, for example. So, so and, and we can just start throwing things out there. We'll do a deeper dive when we get together in April, but what, what, what can or should we consider adding to better address substance use disorder? Kristen. Yeah, I realize I've not actually introduced myself any of the times I've spoken today. <laughs> I'm Kristen Wells, she, her pronouns. I have lived experience with my own mental health condition. Uh, I've been the primary caregiver for my husband when he was disabled by his mental health condition. And I grew up with a sibling with a serious mental illness. I'm also a licensed social worker working in the uh, after hours crisis system for a community mental health agency. Um, I definitely think a big thing for um, our, our system oversight is looking at whether services are divided in the places that are providing crisis services. Um, this is something that um, has come up a few times today, and I've also seen in my work is that someone will say, you know, I'm in crisis, I need to go to inpatient, and then we'll try to get them into treatment, and the um, the mental health inpatient facility will say, well, we don't have we don't have what we need to support you through detox. We can't medically support you through a detox to give you your mental health treatment, and then um, the substance use treatment facility will say, well, we can't take the risk of having you come to our inpatient facility while there's a risk of you doing something like harming yourself. If, if you're having suicidal ideation, we can't take you. 
So this person needs both detox and support for remaining safe and can't get either because there's no facility that is willing to help them with both at the same time. Um, so I think it's really important when we're looking at system oversight to ask, measure, make sure the facilities where people can go for help can actually help them with all the things they need help with at once instead of saying you can only get help for one thing at a time. I hear you, Kristen. I think that's yeah one of the biggest things that's come out of the conversation today. I also saw a little, I don't know if you saw it, you could see it, but Puck offered some applause. So I think Puck echoes that comment um, about looking for how we in, improve the system and measure that we're improving it to, to make sure they can treat the whole person, we're removing those barriers that prevent uh, people with co-occurring SUD and behavioral health or mental health conditions to be treated. Alicia. I know Michael mentioned this during the panel, and so I just want to bring it up again because I think it's particularly important and my background overseeing a team that's going out into the community, it's having all levels of professionals on a team from peers to clinicians, um, but also like healthcare professionals, nurses, ARNPs to support a person regardless of what the crisis is. So if they're calling and you're going out, being able to go out and support that person with their their mental health crisis or their substance use crisis and understanding what resources are available for both. Because I think oftentimes when, when the thought of like crisis comes up, it's this person is gonna need some type of like crisis stabilization facility or an inpatient behavioral health support. And um, actually they've overdosed and their crisis is that they are interested in treatment and do you know how to help that person get there? And so I think it's, having um, a system that that not only supports somebody if they want to go somewhere, but if you're if you are having people go out to meet somebody in their moment of crisis, that they are equipped to support that person regardless of what that crisis looks like. So Alicia, I'm already thinking of the categories of recommendations we've come up with, and that seems to fall under training. It seems to fall under the collaboration and coordination pieces. Um, I'm seeing Michael applaud uh, that comment. So I think I think he echoes what you said. Um, so let's make sure to flag that and talk about that more when we get together next month. Um, I do want to um, uh, relay a comment from Darcy. One of the insurance um, exclusions, including M Medicaid MCOs to admission to an inpatient psych unit is primary substance use disorder. This might be something to explore. And Anne, I think you brought that up as well, that that's a, an issue. So thank you for that. Other folks, so back to just a reminder of the, um, of the question, reflecting on those guiding principles and proposals for metrics that we developed at our last Chris meeting, based on what you learned today or what you already knew about substance use disorder, what else should we add to better address substance use disorder? Thoughts? Anna. I just want to echo what uh, Representative Davis mentioned in capturing the data. I think it's really important, especially if uh, you know, 23 hour crisis facilities are saying that they are a no wrong door, that it needs to be clearly documented if they turn people away and there needs to be a record of that. Um, and also making sure that when people are discharged, uh, that they are provided the resources for both substance use disorder and for, um, for mental health treatment. And, you know, just ensuring that people are given the tools to succeed when they are discharged. So I heard you when we're talking about metrics, measuring, actually measuring when people are turned away and why, and then also whether they're getting the full range of resources they would need to, to, to remain stable after they leave. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Anna. Other thoughts? Michelle. Well, you know, this is when I fly in to talk about workforce. <laughs> Um, and what I'm hearing is so um, amazing uh, ideas and thoughts. And um, all this comes back to who's going to do the work. How do we reduce the barriers 
for people to get the training that is needed. We have siloed systems, uh, approaches, all everything. I, I I haven't been speaking up because everybody's been saying what uh, what I you know I've been thinking and what I see in my role at Crisis Connections. Um, there's much work we could be doing as well to make sure that people are aware of what services are out there. You know, we're really working hard to make sure that people are aware of the Washington uh, Recovery Helpline that we operate and that we're accessible and <clears throat> meeting the needs there. Uh, we are about to, in partnership with Department of Health, to launch a, a bridge bridger program, we're calling it, for people to be able to get medically assisted treatment right in the ER and get dosed and then immediately get uh, signed up with um, a provider in their community to continue that work. So there's some great efforts that are coming, but we keep coming back to who's going to do the work. How do we elevate uh, peers? How do we make sure that all the barriers that many of it is financial, uh, the ability to have the time to dedicate to, to learn this craft? Um, so again, I, I really appreciate all the work that's happened with particularly our state legislators in building a, a pipeline, but we are way behind already. Um, we have to have that representative workforce to do this uh, because we're already running out of, of uh, people to be able to do this important work that we all know it can't be done by bots. It has to be people who are trained, talented, uh, ideally who have that lived experience as well. So, um, so Jamie, thanks for letting me fly in with that comment always. I always find an opportunity, uh, but um, we're already very, very stretched on finding talent already. Um, so just want to make sure I, I, I throw that in every chance I get. I am really looking forward to our conversation about workforce in the coming months, Michelle, and all the things that you will have to contribute to that, since I know that that, um, it, 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 I, I appreciate you flying in to share that. I'm going to pause. I see a couple hands up. I'm going to pause because we have a few comments in the chat. Puck, um, I think going back to the previous comments about documentation, about when someone's turned away, Puck adds documenting honestly and non-self-protectively when we can't meet a person's needs um, when they show up for treatment. And so I think that's an important clarification to add, um, uh, echoing Anna's comment earlier. And then Dr. Snowden writes, we track data on number of patients detained by designated crisis responders, but declined psychiatric admission and why? We should probably do the same by mental health and substance use disorder uh, involuntary treatment act mechanisms. So good comments from our other Chris members, Lonnie. Yeah, thanks. I'm attending today for Michelle Roberts. So hopefully it's okay for me to chime in on her behalf. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I was also just with Michelle McDaniel's comment, um, thinking about this related to workforce and training and specifically thinking about our 98 Lifeline crisis counselors um, since people can contact 98 for substance use concerns, and those are, and that's you know something that we promote um, for folks, and it just makes me think how potentially overburdened our crisis counselors could become, just because of how nuanced and complicated this work is. I'm wanting to make sure that they have the support and training um, and resources they need in order to help people who are contacting 98 because of a substance use concern. Um, and so they don't get burned out. And so our centers can maintain a healthy workforce. Thanks for that, Lonnie. And I, yes, I remember hearing that, that that really spoke to me in the panel discussion too, when it was raised, it might've been Rep Davis who talked about this, um, that that not having those tools and that training can be, um, can lead to burnout and distress and, and you know, providers own mental health um, issues. So thank you for bringing that up. Dylan. Yeah, um, as uh, Dr. Snowden was mentioning, that um, I'm thinking about our tools that we have available through Point Click Care, which uh, notifies us around um, ED visits and uh, regarding all sorts of things. But I've, I was also thinking about how uh, there's one cohort, at least in, in my organization, that will have just any behavioral health visit. But if we also had a separate uh, flags for SUD related visits, and then also just looking at how our my agency and also just across the board, how we can better improve the follow-up after um, after discharge. So that's what I'm thinking about of what we can improve there. And also, yeah, so that with that outreach, uh, and hopefully that outreach happens even prior to the discharge actually happening. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's a theme here I'm hearing with data collection and follow-up. So um, 
we will definitely track that. And I'm, I'm going to save the chat here too, because we have some of those good chat messages along the same lines as well. Thanks, Dylan. Darcy. There we go. Um, I'm thinking of more of a process measures. I'm thinking about the 23 hour facilities and the um, physiology behind substance use disorder withdrawal. Um, when we look at data um, regarding primary substance use disorder diagnoses in the EDs, the number one primary diagnosis is alcohol um, addiction. And I think that, um, and that, you know, is also a very dangerous withdrawal. So I think that um, one of the potential process measures could be um, some kind of um, uh, reassurance that there's collaboration or there's pathways that are clear between the emergency departments and the 23 at our facilities. Because I suspect that many, um, many people will start in an emergency department and if they could have a nice handoff to a 23 hour facility that feels confident that they can safely take care of them, I think um, that would be a measure of a success for our system. Yes. Thank you for raising that, Darcy. I'm glad we're really thinking about these 23 hour, these 23 hour facilities too, with them coming online soon. All right. Other, other responses from Chris members on this question. What else should we add to address substance use disorder? I think we have a lot of good fodder for conversation next month when we're together in, in real life. I'm also thinking that there's a lot to process today from what we've learned. Um, and so if you want to marinate in this for a little bit, um, we can continue to, we should continue to circle back to this. Michael. Yeah, I think what else we should add to better address SED is um, we dealing with entities that don't, that are banding about the idea of harm reduction without actually executing it safely and being trauma informed while they do it. Um, it's really cool to say um, harm reduction and our facilities are harm reductive and this platform and this outreach team were harm reductive, but they're, they, um, in my experience, I'm seeing, I'm seeing it used as a shortcut on the way to doing less. Um, and, and what does that look like? It looks like harm reduction as a tool, but it is not the treatment is what I mean. And I think it is being, it is being fronted as the treatment. So um, I just want people to have a better understanding of what harm reduction really is. And that can only be done from, um, they can really be done by persons that are really doing this work on a, on a consistent basis and um, addressing people um, that are in crisis on a regular basis and not, um, Harm reduction can be the, the, the key phrase for me. I'm, I'm careful because it usually means when it's not done right, that bodies are being monetized and data is being monetized. And so I just kind of like, we got to be on the lookout for people that want to provide such a thing um, down the road for crisis centers and contracts and, and such, and that they're not just hanging on for the ride in the pocketbook. That's all. So Michael, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like your observation is that sometimes people will say they're offering harm reduction um, when it's not really result, if the outcome is not harm reduction and on top of that treatment, actual treatment of the underlying condition is not being provided. Um, and you think that 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 that's sometimes motivated by- well, harm reduction. Persons and entities claiming harm reduction can actually block the access to actual treatment. Ah, uh, okay. And that's that's happening on a more consistent basis, in my experience, without naming names and entities. Okay, so your your thought is as we're thinking about how we what we should add to address substance use disorder, we should be mindful of really understanding what is meant by harm reduction, and 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 that that's happening in a meaningful way, not a not a obstructive way. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, I think that if there's no last comments or questions that that comes to the end of our discussion and group processing time, um, we can move into action items and next steps and then do public comment. So I just, uh, again, wanna thank each of you for your engagement today, for your great questions and for all of your um, group processing. I learned a lot today um, and I also really appreciate this discussion because it helped me um, process what we learned today. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in April and doing more of this, carrying it into our work. Um, I'm going to ask Nicola to review our action items and next steps coming out of today's meeting. Thank you, Jamie. So the um, action item I've got is following up on the um, listening sessions, information about the DOH suicide prevention plan listening sessions. And then I think we'll need to take a look at meeting notes on some of the other more specific action items as well. Yeah, I think there were a couple of questions that um, I think Lonnie was going to answer. Um, so we can go back to the meeting notes and, and send those out as a summary. Um, thank you. Okay. And Chloe, just checking in, any um, any additional signups that we received for public comment today? Nope, I did not get any on my end. Okay. So Laura Van Tosh signed up, but I don't see Laura in the participants. Laura, are you here? If you can just raise your hand. I don't see your name in the list. Okay. Well, before we close out then, community members, thank you as ever for being here. Um, if we, we still have a few minutes left, so if, if there are any community members who would like to make a public comment today, um, please feel free to put up your hand now. I'll just give it a few seconds here to let people think about that. All right, well, Chris members, I might give you a, a few minutes back in your day to get a breather. Um, as ever, it is such a privilege to be with you. Um, and uh, Michael, thank you. I know you have to go. Thank you so much for today. It was wonderful. I, I Lots of people uh, saying how much they appreciated your, your engagement. There's so many faces on this panel that I've missed. Can't wait to hopefully get over to the east side and make it happen. Uh, we sure hope. We schedule now, so maybe it'll happen. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. All right, everyone. Um, so just a reminder, our next meeting is in Spokane, um, April 18th. Do I have that right? April 18th. Um, the, it will be a hybrid meeting. So if it's not possible for you to get to Spokane, there is a hybrid option. But if there's any way you can, of course, love to be with you in real life. Um, and again, thank you, Chris members, for all of your engagement and participation, community members as ever. So grateful for you taking time out of your day to be here and be part of this process um, and wishing you all a good rest of your day. See you soon. Take care, everyone. Right. Thanks, all. Take care. Just a reminder to hosts and co-hosts to save your chats before you hop off. Hi, Jamie. I saw you rejoined. <laughs> Just wanting to make sure we can get your chats.
you, Devin. I think you can end the call now. Oh, I was saying, okay, I will end it. Okay, okay. bye.